Are we ready? Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, the witness to be called is Mr. Desmond van Royen. I would ask that you be sworn in. Please administer the oath of affirmation. Please state your full names for the record. My name is uh, David Atlas Des Van Royen. Do you have any objection to taking the prescribed oath? No. Do you consider the oath to be binding on your conscience? Yes. Do you say that the, the evidence you'll give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing else but the truth? If so, please raise your right hand and say, so help me God. So help me God. You may, you may be seated, Mr. Van Royen. Um, Mr. Halley is going to lead your evidence and he will put questions to you. Uh, he will lead your evidence in order to enable you to put your side of the story and he will also ask questions. If there is any question that you don't understand, please feel free to ask him to repeat it. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I've been approached, Mr. Chairman, by Mr. Van Royen's representatives with the request. Apparently, Mr. Van Royen would like to make, as it were, an opening statement. Um, oh, to, okay. Presumably to forego the need for me to lead him through the evidence. Okay. Uh, is there an indication how much time he might need? Uh, uh, Mr. Van Royen, how much time would you ask for? To make Plus that? minus 10 minutes, Chairperson. Okay, no, that's fine. You, you may do so immediately. You may, you may make your statement immediately. Chairperson, thank you very much, Chairperson. Maybe let me start, Chairperson, by pointing out that the evidence against me was presented sometime in the November 2018. Uh, it's almost uh, two years that I finally have an opportunity to present my side of the story and, of course, to answer questions uh, that the Commission has for me. This means that for two years, Chairperson, I've not been able to present information to the Commission. Of course, information that could mitigate the adverse reports that followed the evidence of those that implicated me in, a, in, in, in state capture and corruption. Chairperson, I'm however grateful for today, not because that my name, which has been tarnished and failed through this process, will finally get reprieve, but because I regard it as my duty to present whatever information I have to the Commission for it to hopefully find the right balance in its findings. I also thank the Commission Chairperson for allowing my legal representatives to cross-examine Mr. Fuzile, who presented his evidence implicating me in some wrongdoing, albeit the time was just too short. The right to procedural fairness is an important constitutional right and shall be practiced by all and sundry. The credibility chairperson of the Commission depends entirely on how its processes have complied with this important constitutional guaranteed right. The decision to hear my story is far different from a prejudicial decision taken by the former public protector, Mrs. Tulima Donsen. When she published her report, that report we all know is a precursor to the establishment of this commission. Without giving me a chance to respond to adverse findings that implicated me in some wrongdoing. Compounding this chairperson was the fact that all this happened after Mr. Matonsela herself assured me that, I mean Mrs. Matonsela herself assured me that a report made no adverse findings, did not express a point of view, and did not make recommendations involving 
any allegations concerning me and that if there was such a report that implicated me, my procedural rights under the Constitution, the PAJA, as well as the Public Protector Act will be respected. Chairperson, I'm here today and I can assure to you that that assurance was never kept. Instead, she relied on a media article about a cell phone tower record on my cell number to implicate me in this serious, serious allegation of state capture and corruption without giving me a chance to respond. Chairperson, I think it's important for me to emphasize the above point because already the so-called Court of Public Opinion had long concluded and issued a verdict, a verdict that myself and anyone associated with His Excellency President Zuma are corrupt and for those corrupt reasons allowed private interest to capture our democratic state and its institutions to advance co uh, corrupt motives. All this happened of this or because of this expeditiously compiled report by a former public protector. It is interesting, Chairperson, uh, but not surprising to note that at the center of this court of public opinion is a political narrative that is driven by a biased white-owned media controlled by white capital. This is the same white capital, if we are to be remembered, I mean, to, to, if we are to remember. This is the same white capital that acquired its control over the economic resources of our country through the cruel exploitation of the blood and sweat of the, the black people during the era of the evil system of apartheid. Chairperson, this is the same white capital in the mid-80s that smelled the coffee of the coming liberation and with cunning schemes, smartly dumped the apartheid government which they had created, nurtured and used for its exploitative and greedy pursuit to recruit and form new alliances with the neoliberals factions within our ranks. We should remember that time, Chair, the ANC was regarded by all as a government in waiting. All this created an opportunity for this white capital to continue shaping the public policy of our democratic state in a manner that protected and advanced their own selfish socio-economic and political interests. Chairperson, please, please, let South Africans not be fooled. The socio-economic and political interest of white capital is not to boldly address inequalities, poverty, and growth as they continuously claim in their own, own uh, media. Their interests remain and will continue to be accumulation of unjustified profits through the exploitation of our people and the nation's resource. That is why since the advent of our new democracy, the gap between the rich and the poor continue to increase to dangerous levels. Our revolutionary uh, reconstruction and development plan policy frame, which was our policy framework, was abandoned, Chairperson, to pursue neoliberal policies that are not aimed at ensuring real structural changes to the ra racialized patterns of our econo economic ownership and control. The gap of poverty continues to widen, with the rich and privileged becoming more richer and more privileged. The poor uh, continue to get poorer and there is currently no hope for them. Even the revolutionary demands of our constitutions are not met because this important legal instrument has been hijacked to largely entrench interest of white monopoly capital instead of going down our, our own uh, 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 resolution that we took before. We might want to downplay this, Chairperson, because of the strong media influence uh, on our perceptions. But the reality is that white capital, which created the apartheid era, was strong under it. It is enmeshed and it is entangled in our new democratic government system and works with some among us and works with established global financial market role players to continue with their exploitative wealth uh, over accumulation program at the expense of our own developmental priorities enshrined in our national development plan. It is important to underscore the fact that this evil alliance does not act alone. They have definitely selectively co-opted some among us. 
It is for this reason, Chairperson, that I support the call for the expansion of this commission in terms of reference. Because I think in Ta'alia, this will accord uh, this commission an opportunity to investigate the relationship of wild capital with uh, our new democratic state. Accommodating this definitely will shed some much needed light on a plethora of questions and perceptions about our democratic state and its relationship with private interest. I just want to cite some few examples. Example like why out of all ministers or ministries decided out of our negotiated settlement, the National Treasury, an important ministry needed to immediately deal with revenue generation and resources distribution was assigned to a certain Chris Liebenberg, a former net bank and net core executive. Why at its infancy uh, stage our government revenue was allowed to be shrunk, adopting unjustified economic measures like, like, like what they did, the drastic, or maybe what we did, the drastic reduction of corporate tax rate, allowing wealthy white South Africans and their companies to move apartheid and capital to offshore side. Why did we allow companies like Lonmin, MTN, and Shanduga fi financially offshore into zero tax havens? Government of national unit was allowed to sign general agreement on tariffs and trade on adverse attempts, leading to a drastic fall on custom tariffs and tariffs revenue that we need for our development agenda. Why, Chairperson? Sorry for our, my just uh, Sorry, sorry. Without being, <clears throat> without being um, rude towards Mr. <clears throat> von Royen, it has been 13 minutes that he's been speaking. He asked for 10 minutes. I'm not sure how much longer he's going to be. Uh, uh, no, uh, leave it to me. Um, I'll no. give him some more time. Thank you, Mr. You Chair. may continue, Mr. Van Royen. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Why our domestically and uh, democratically developed policy framework of reconstruction and, and development program, RDP, which was a product of extensive consultations. I know the previous uh, witness indicated that we don't have business of engaging our people. This is a document that was developed by the people. Why this document was apparently suppl supplanted by something that was developed in London or in Washington called uh, uh, the Growth Employment and Redistribution Gear? I mean, despite all its uh, uh, promises, or when it was introduced, we were promised of growth rates, we were promised of employment, we were promised of redistribution. We are still waiting. Our people are having it tough. Why did this, this new democratic government, uh, Chairperson, allow a foreigner by the name of uh, Colin Andrews, former South, uh, South African Airways CEO, to sell 61 uh, of our, of our uh, airline aircraft to a private company and one bank to lease them? from the same company at a cost of 1.46 billion per annum to our state. Money which was supposed to have been used to strengthen the current ailing uh, national airline balance sheet. As if this was not enough, Chairperson, the same CEO was given a golden handshake of more than 200 million after spending only two and a half years at the airline. Why, Chairperson, is it possible for a minister under our current uh, democratic government, in the name of Prabin Kodan, who is a serving minister in our democratic and non-racial government, uh, uh, charged to overlook and uh, obviously ensure that there is compliance in, in the, uh, the, the department that is leading the, the current uh, department of... Uh, in five minutes' time, it will be double the time you asked for. So Correct. Yeah. I think you why, why, why this minister is allowed to overlook and disregard competent and highly qualified black professionals, and in most instances replace them with less qualified individuals. Why is it possible, Chairperson, so easy for former min national treasury ministers and uh, deputy ministers and senior national treasury officials to be absorbed by financial institution just immediately? It happens automatically. Immediately after they attend at national treasury, I mean, they are absorbed. I've coined this development what, uh, what is called a revolving door phenomenon. Why is it so possible? Why is it so obvious? And we are not asking this question. I think if 
the terms of reference of this commission chairperson are extended, definitely will get to understand why some of these things are happening. Why uh, 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 the leading party, the ruling party, elective conference, private sector has so much in that conference, they pump in so much money in that conference just to make sure that their preferred candidate comes out of that. Is this not the science of state capture? But also, Chairperson, I'm more worried about this development of Nasrat because there is a strong allegation that uh, there were some members of our judiciary system who were involved in this particular process. Because there is an embargo, embargo to what I call report, that we think at some stage will shed some more light. But I'm saying it will accord us an opportunity, Chairperson, to understand the relationship of private interest and our new democratic state. Lastly, Chairperson, after all this bad and malicious pub publicity about myself, I want to assure South Africans of my continued commitment to our far from over. Our struggle is not yet over. It's a say in the landlord for their full emancipation, including real economic empowerment. This is a commitment I made at an early age of my life, Chairperson, when it was not fashionable, fashionable to do so. I gave up my youth days and academic opportunities and led from the front as a young activist and I'm struggling operative. In all the positions I served, I must assure you, Chairperson, as a leader, I was democratically elected or assigned by my organization. I never and I will never sell my soul to the highest bidder for me to be elected to a leadership position. And no amount of character assassination and intimidation is going to distract me from tackling real development challenges facing our country and our people. And Chair, the allegations made against me uh, by Mr. Fuzile that I was deployed as a Minister of Finance to capture national treasury for nefarious agenda of feeding insatiable in, in interests of private greedy interests. It's a political lie made by those afraid that national treasury is a national asset which has a duty to drive our collective agenda to develop our state beyond its current mediocrity. Not that an entity in, you know, in isolation. This is a, a National Treasury is, like any other ministry, is the ministry of this government of the people by the people. And I must indicate to yourself, Chairperson, that I stand by what I've said in my affidavits and, and on, 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 on the many aspects relevant to the terms of reference, save on one aspect, I mean, relating to the date on which I met uh, His Excellency President Zuma before I was sworn in as the Minister of Finance. In my affidavit, the chairperson, I said uh, that I met the president uh, uh, on the 9th of December, 2015. In fact, it was on the 8th of December, 2015. I was assisted in this regard by my cell phone records, which were given to me some time uh, last year. Thank you again, chairperson. I'm now available to answer questions from the commission. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Van uh, thank you for coming to assist the Commission, and I must say that uh, I've never had any complaint that you have not uh, cooperated with the Commission, uh, so uh, you applied for leave to cross-examine Mr. Funzile that was dealt with, and I think in, the, in your application you indicated that you would make yourself available, uh, so this time has arrived. Mr. Halley? You may proceed. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Mr. Vizli, just to um, commence with the affidavit that you filed before this commission, there have in fact been three affidavits, and I want to take you specifically to two. If you would turn with me to advisors of one bundle, Mr. Chairperson. Just check that it is the correct one, Mr. Van Rooyen, whether at, on, on the spine at the back is written advisors one. Yes, I can confirm that yeah, this okay. is the correct one. And if you would turn with me, dear sir, to page uh, 110. You have to raise your voice, Mr. Pardon me, Mr. Chair. Speak closer to the mic. <clears throat> yeah. If you would turn with me, Mr. Van Rooyen, to page 110 of that bundle. Now, bear in mind that you've got to look at the top left numbering system. Oh, not right. Okay. The black numbers. Correct. 110. That yes, is so, I'm Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I 
found it, Chair. Thank you. And if you would then <clears throat> keep that page open, but turn with me to page 146 of the same document. That's your it. signature, is it? Yes, that's my signature. And this document is the statement that you provided to the Commission? Yes, I am. And in the statement you address the allegations that were raised um, by Mr. Fuzile against you, is that correct? Correct. Uh, maybe you could confirm that uh, its contents are true and correct, maybe save in regard to the matter of the date when you met Mr. Zuma, if that is contained in this statement. I do confirm. You do confirm. Thank you. <clears throat> now, if you could, um, for your benefit, and I'll take you through certain parts of your statement, and you're obviously at liberty, I'll ask you specific questions, but you're at liberty um, to supply after answering this question, you're at liberty to actually supply certain detail or an explanation um, relevant to your answer. My understanding if, <clears throat> is that you, 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 start, you, you were appointed on the, uh, on the 10th of December of 2015 as the Minister of Finance, but the, the announcement or well, let me rephrase that, the swearing in took place on the 10th of December 2015, but the announcement took place on the 9th of December 2015. Is that correct? Correct. And if I understand correctly, um, based on the change that you've indicated or the amendment that you've indicated this morning or today, you're saying that in fact you did not meet with the President on the 9th of December, as indicated in your statement, you in fact met with him the day before, which would have been the 8th of December. Correct. And if you had met with the President on the day before that, that would have been the day before the announcement for the removal of Mr. Nene had been given. Would that be correct? Correct. So when the President spoke to you on the 8th, you're telling, you're telling this tribunal, that he had indicated to you his intention to remove Mr. Nene as the Minister of Finance. Is that correct? May you please repeat your question? So when the, minister, when the President, Mr. Zuma, spoke with you on the 8th of December, he would have told you at the same time that it was in his intention to remove Mr. Nene as the, as the Minister of Finance. Is that correct? Correct. It's so obvious. Now, that particular meeting that you had with the President, at what time of the day did it take place? If my memory serves me well, Chairperson, the meeting took place in the evening. I can't remember the exact time, but it was in the evening. Um, <clears throat> Was it in the late evening, the early evening? You recall? Yeah, maybe between uh, eight and ten. Okay. Now, if we can just take a step back a little bit to understand how your appointment took place. If my recollection serves me correctly with regard to your statement, you had in fact been <clears throat> um, in Durban at the time when the president phoned you. Is that correct? Yes. And that was to, to request that you come up to Johannesburg to meet with him. Yes, to be around out there, Minister Lee Johannesburg. I see. And at the time you were in Durban on holiday, do you understand that correctly? Yes, I was with my family here in Durban. With your family? Yes. And you then flew back 
to, uh, to Johannesburg uh, in order to meet with the president at some stage on the 7th, 8th or 9th, if I recall correctly, because at that stage when the president had contacted you, correct. he hadn't indicated specifically which day he would meet with you. That's correct. Well, Mr. Ali, uh, I think when you mean how dang you say Johannesburg, and I think that's because quite a lot of people associate Gauteng with Johannesburg, even when somebody's going to Pretoria. <laughs> no, no, <absolutely. clears throat> um, no he, he emphasized that the president asked him to come to Gauteng. You Thank had you, said Mr. Johannesburg, Chief. so... No, no, absolutely. I think in his statement he says Gauteng as well. Yes, um, yes. <clears throat> so forgive me if I keep mentioning Johannesburg. What I was referring to, or at least I thought I was referring to, was the flight back to, to oh, Johannesburg. Oh, okay, okay. The <clears throat> now that flight, if I recall correctly, was on the 7th of December, is that correct? I have to check my statement, but I know it was, I think that was on the 7th of December, I'm not sure, but it's around that time. You, because you, the request of uh, the president was that I should be around uh, Houting. Uh, between the seventh, any time from the seventh and the ninth. Sure. Okay. Oh. <clears throat> but I also not didn't land. I landed at uh, Oar Tambo Airport. I, I like that name, Oar Tambo Airport. Sorry, I can't hear what uh, you're saying. If you could speak into the mic. I was saying and, I landed. And face this side so I can. Yes. Oh yeah, sure. Yes. I think that's that's correct. Chair. I should I should be addressing the, <laughs> the evidence leader through you. So, sorry for that, chair. But I was saying. Mm. Uh, I landed at O.R. Tambo Airport. Mm. Yes. On, on I, I think I wanted to emphasize that because uh, yeah. there is some resistance in acknowledging that we have renamed that airport. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, and that was on the 7th of uh, December of 2015. Yes. Okay. Now, <clears throat> if you would turn with me to page 125 of the same bundle. At paragraph 33 of that bundle, you mention at the foot of the page that on the 6th of December, while you were on holiday, you say, I received a call from the former President Zuma informing me that he wanted to see me between the 7th and the 10th of December of 2015 in Gauteng. You say you immediately abandoned your family holiday and you flew back uh, to Gauteng on the 7th of December of 2015. Now, <clears throat> at when you arrived in, uh, in Johannesburg or in Gauteng, did you then contact the president or were you expecting a call from him? I didn't contact the president. I expected a call from him. I think that was enough for him that he communicated with me on the 7th. Uh, on the 6th, in fact. So I was waiting for a call from him or from his office. Sorry, your voice keeps fading away. If you wouldn't mind speaking into the microphone, sir. I think he says he was waiting for a call from the former president. That's what you are saying? Yes. yes After sir. arriving in Johannesburg, you did not call the president. You waited for his call. That was the instruction. Uh, yeah, Chairperson. okay. That was the instruction, so I stick to the instruction. Okay. Now, <clears throat> now you say in your statement, if you... Uh, continue in the same paragraph on the 9th of December 2015 I was called by a gentleman from the presidency requesting me to uh, come to Mashlamba and Lopu presidential offices in Pretoria for a meeting <coughs> with the former president Zuma. You say you arrived on the following page. I arrived at the meeting um, as scheduled. Now if I understand correctly what you said is that that particular meeting actually took place on the 8th of, uh, in fact, took place on the 8th of uh, December in the evening. Correct, Chairperson, not on the, on the night. Now, this telephone call that you received from a gentleman in the presidency, what time was that call? 
it was a landline call. Yeah. Pardon me? It was a landline call. It was not yes. from the cell phone. Yes, the question is what time was the call? Or the time? Ah, I will be lying. I don't remember. I don't remember. I mean, the fact that I was called by the high office, truly speaking, a lot went through my mind. So I can't remember the specific time. I will be lying. I don't want to lie to the commission. <clears throat> now, the, I just want to understand, when you flew back to Johannesburg, you, you came back to Johannesburg on your own. You left your family in Durban, is that correct? Yeah, hey, you know, it was not easy because we traveled uh, collectively uh, with uh, uh, my family and we're not uh, even flying. I think some flew, but I, I drove with my boys. So, yeah, so it was not easy. So when you came sure. back to Gauteng in response to the for, former president's call, did you drive together with some members of your family? No, 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 Chair, I flew back. You flew? Because I, I didn't want to disturb. Oh. That's one thing that I don't want. I don't want to involve my family in yeah. some of these things. So okay. I left them to continue enjoying their holiday. Or did you drive to go to Durban? I, some uh, members of the with family. With the family? Yeah, because it's a family and an extended family. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay. some flew, some, some flew. And I drove okay. with my boys. Oh. I mean, my wife took the girls yes. and they flew. Yeah. Okay. okay. And when you got back to Johannesburg, you got to the airport. <clears throat> How did you travel from your airport to wherever your destination was from that point? Did you take a taxi? Did you take a shuttle? Did, you, did somebody pick you up? How did you no, get no, to no. your we, destination? No, no, no. We left uh, one of the cars there. Remember, the, the, those who flew, my wife had to drive and left the car there. So I used the car that we left at the airport. Okay, so you had a vehicle at the airport? Yes, I had a vehicle at the at, oh, And whose vehicle airport. was that? Sorry? Do you recall whose vehicle that was? That's, uh, that's my family vehicle. What vehicle was it? I think we left the Prado there. We drove with a buggy. Uh, uh, uh. It was a buggy? No, I think it was a, a, a Prado. A which? I'm... A Prado. A Prado? Yes. Okay, do you recall the registration number of the Prado? Just off the to top check, of your head. I have to check my phone. Yeah, you know, the cars, I don't uh, memorize the registration, but I, I have to check them. I, I can provide that information to the commission. Yeah, same. you can and provide it to uh, the same same course. Yeah. And then where did you travel to from that point? So you, <clears throat> you alight from the, from the airplane, you then go over to your Bucky, that's, or your, sorry, your Prado, you get into the Prado, and where do you go to at that point in time? I think if my memory serves me well, Chairperson, because I can't remember step by step what happened after I've landed, but I think if my memory serves me well, I went home. Okay. And home would be where? In the Johannesburg South. The side In the Johannesburg Ward. South. Oh, That's where okay. my residence is. Yes. Okay. Now, presumably, <clears throat> If I understand correctly from the sequence of events in your affidavit, presumably at that stage when the president um, had invited you to come or asked you to come back to, to Gauteng in order to meet with you um, either the 7th, 8th or 9th of uh, December, you had some idea or some inkling of what the purpose of this discussion was. To be honest, uh, because I had meetings before, as I've indicated in my affidavit, with the president around uh, various issues. So I knew uh, around that time that there are some rumors about reshuffling and that. So, you know, when you are called by the high office and then there are this, that, uh, such developments taking place in the country, there's no way in which you can't think of uh, I may be called to be assigned, or I may be called, you know, you don't know, but uh, definitely I had my own suspicions, you know. Mm. Mm. But when you say you had suspicions, you knew <clears throat> that there was a possibility that you were going to be reassigned? 
Yes, that's what, I'm, that's what I've just said, uh, because by, uh, around that time, uh, Chairperson, uh, obviously there was a rumor about uh, cabinet reshoveling and all that. So, you know, that was one of the things that uh, came to my mind. Yes, okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> on the 6th of December, when you get invited or you get asked to come back to Gauteng, you already immediately, you are aware that there's, there's likely to be a cabinet reshuffle. And the first thing that, or one of the things that comes to mind at any rate, whether it be the first or otherwise, is that the, you're likely to be redeployed into a cabinet position, correct? Not correct. I've Not never correct. said it was the first thing. I, I thought of Sorry, I corrected things. that. I said first or otherwise. Oh, yeah, he corrected himself. Or first or otherwise. Yeah. Correct. And then I agree. And in fact, you had already given the president your CV at that stage, if I recall correctly. Correct. In one of the meetings that happened before. But the CV, if the president says, hey, we request your CV, doesn't imply then you are going to be deployed as a minister. No. You might be deployed as an ambassador, you might be reassigned to do any other thing. That's yes. the nature of our organization, you know? Yes. yes. So, so uh, I think your, your, your statement says, it was on the 30th of, no of November 2015 when uh, uh, you were called by the presidency and you were invited to submit your CV, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, and you sure. submitted your CV on that date? Yes, because I was in, in parliament. Yes, so yes. So it was easy for me just to go to my office and print my CV. Yes, you know, no, no, yes. that's fine. Okay. But it happened, Chair, let me just uh, indicate. Paragraphs before that yeah. indicates that there were other meetings yes. uh, that had to do with my work in Parliament, yeah. where I was to brief the President. Yes, yeah. Okay. And just to, just to get back to the, to the conversation that you would have had with the President and some of the things that were going through your mind, um, you get the call from the President requiring you or requesting you to come back to Gauteng on the 6th of December, you know at that stage that you've already given the President uh, your CV on the 30th of November. What goes through your mind, whether at that point or shortly after, is in light of the rumours that are circulating that there's going to be a cabinet reshuffle, you anticipate that you are going to be redeployed. You understand, do you understand that part correct thus far? Yes, I do understand, among other things. And if I understand correctly, you anticipate that it may be a position in Cabinet that you will be appointed to. Among other things, I anticipated that. Sure. And <clears throat> you also understand from the uh, telephone call with the President that you should make yourself available anywhere between these three dates. Um, the 7th, 8th or 9th of December. Do you understand that correctly? I do understand. Now, during the course of that discussion with the President, does he, <clears throat> does he indicate whether this particular issue is something of, uh, of grave urgency? Does he give you any indication of what the nature of the meeting will, with him will be? Over the phone. Over the phone, yeah. No, no, not at all. Not at all. On that, on the 8th of December of 2015, um, you've, ju you've just returned now, you returned in fact on the 7th. What is the first thing you do the following day? That's now the 8th of December, what is the first thing you do? On the 8th of December? Mm. I check with my, uh, my office at Lituli House on uh, what are the outstanding things that need to be done. I check with my secretary. I went to Lituli House to my office. Now, <clears throat> I'm just trying to, 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 to understand because you're supposed to be on holiday at this stage. Why do you, why do you check in with your secretary at Lituli House? Let me just understand that. You know, uh, time is of essence. I mean, the, I was on holiday, now I'm no longer on holiday, I'm waiting for a call. I can't stand and fold my arms when I have other duties to perform. One of my tasks, and which was a pressing task, especially around festive time in January, is to 
ensure that uh, those members of the association that um, it's the treasurer general, their welfare issues are attended to. So that was a priority to me. And uh, that, that's, that's exactly what I did instead of uh, sitting and waiting for a call. Okay. So <clears throat> if I understand correctly, you had in fact been appointed, according to your statement, you had been appointed as the Treasurer General of the MK Veterans Association um, as early as October, sorry, as September of 2015. Correct. Now going back to, and we're going to come to the, the events of the 8th of December in a moment. Going back to the, to the events of, after your appointment as the Treasurer General of the MK Veterans Association, According to your statement, you in fact acknowledge that you would have met on several occasions after that with, <clears throat> with Mr. Rajesh Tony Gupta at yes. the Gupta residence. Yes, it did. And uh, it's not only Rajesh. I met various business people as part of my responsibility. Yes, I'm concerned specifically with Mr. Gupta. But since you mentioned that you met with various business people, are you saying that you met with them at the Gupta compound or the Gupta residence? No, all over. Not, no, not at the Gupta residence. All over. That's the work of a treasurer general, if maybe the evidence leader doesn't understand, is to, among other things, to create a relationship with businesses uh, with the sole intention of ensuring that uh, you, 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 you attend to budgetary requirements of the association but also you attend to the welfare issues of your members. And uh, that's, that's a very difficult task because uh, the real of the matter is that uh, our association is not an association that is supported by big business. So you have to meet extensively with those considerate and progressive uh, business people uh, and extensively uh, uh, outreach to make sure that you fulfill your mandate. And that's exactly what I did. So, it's not uh, about meeting them at the Gupta's residence. No, we meet them at various uh, places, with myself and my fundraising team in some cases, but also myself and some, uh, of course, support from my members of the executive when there is a need. Um, you might have to bring the, your, your mic closer to you. Uh, uh, sometimes I don't hear. Let's see if you can bring it, or oh, when you speak, come a bit closer to it. All right. Sorry yeah. for that, Chair. Mm. The meetings with Mr. Tony Gupta, were those always at the Gupta residence in Saxon World, or did they take place elsewhere? If my memory serves me well, because uh, there are cases where I meet uh, Rajesh or Tony Gupta at the residence, there are cases where I met them in, as companies in their meetings in, the, uh, in their offices in Santen. Uh, so it's the, the, the meetings didn't only take place, uh, some of the meetings that I remember they didn't only take place at their residence. And what the, all these meetings in your capacity as the MK Veterans Association Treasurer General, or were they, was there any other capacity? No, no, that was the only capacity. So. Can we accept then that we, on every occasion that you would have met with Mr. Gupta, that's Mr. Tony Gupta, there was no other capacity. You met with him solely for the purpose of conducting the affairs of the MK Veterans Association. Correct. Now, <clears throat> in, on each of these different occasions that you would have met with him, would you have been uh, insofar as the MK Veterans Association is concerned, would you have been on your own? Or would there have been other people from the Veterans Association with you? No, in other meetings, of course, uh, we, 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 I had to rope in some members of uh, our association, more especially from the executive. More, more especially? Sorry? From Sorry, the executive. More especially? More, more especially, especially from the executive. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> 
now chair, chair, you know i'm very vigilant i hope these microphones are properly sanitized eh? i'm still too young to leave this yes actually, <laughs> I, we no, still have a lot of work no, to do in this no country. no you, you you are right i i don't know if they were it was sanitized after the but they would they would normally do that was it done mr mr reverend it was it done before it was done just sanitized again mm. No, thank you for raising that, Mr. Van Royen. Yes. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. And can you give us an indication of approximately how, on how many occasions you met with Mr. Tony Gupta? No, I, I, will, the I, will, I will be lying. I can't remember. But uh, as I've indicated in my affidavit, I met with them on several. I met Mr. Tony Gupta, and he introduced me to companies. Uh, uh, that uh, did, did, did business with, uh, with himself and other members of the Gupta family. Would it be correct to say it was several times, or would that not be correct? It will be correct. Yeah. It would be correct. It will be correct. But how many times you can't remember? I can't remember. I, yes, I no, that's late. fine. Yeah. That's fine. Are you able to remember when it was, more or less, when you met him for the first time? Not necessarily in the, the first capacity time, to be honest of with you, Chair, let me just general, but meeting him for the first time in whatever capacity. Okay, let me, let me sketch this scenario, Chair. Mm. How I came to know uh, Mr. Rajesh. They came to our offices after my election. Your offices? Yes, at the yeah. Tully House, after my election. Oh, at the ANC headquarters? Yes. Yes. And then we had a discussion. Mm. Uh, because remember, we are fresh from conference. So oh, when, when would that have been? Around October. Of 2015? 2015, yes. Oh, okay, all right. And yes. then they introduced himself to me. Yes. As, uh, yes. Was it a, an, an arranged meeting or... No, it was, it was not an arranged meeting. You know, that's why I usually run away from uh, Little House because when you're in that office, you don't have time to work because people come unannounced. Yes. You know? So I, I, don't know no if maybe, I don't know if maybe he was in that uh, uh, office because the, he had a meeting with other people mm. and uh, realized that uh, we, we were in the office. I'm not sure. Oh, but it okay. was not an arrangement. It was not even an appointment. He had okay. appointments in my office. Okay. To be with you, so he, 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 as far as you know, he was not there to meet you as no, such. No, 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 no. But he, he, he came into your office. Correct. Yeah. Rest. Continue. Correct. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> so that was so October 2015 is the first time you met him. That was the first time I met. Yes. Him. Correct. But you yeah. can't remember around what date or by any chance. The, the, what, what will bring me uh, bring uh, my submission to the date is the date of the conference. If you look at because it happened immediately after the conference. Uh, of, of Some the few conference. days after the conference. Of, of, the, of the association. Of, of the association, which you are, yeah. Oh, okay. So what, if you remember that date, then you would know when it was that he met you. Are you saying that... No, no, no. I'm, I'm not saying I can remember, but I'm just saying what I remember is it happened closer. Or closer to the date of the conference. The, the, our of, conference, yeah. Of the the M conference, the conference where I was selected to come in oh, as a treasurer okay, general. Okay, yeah. okay, all right. Mm. But the, <clears throat> that meeting wasn't intended um, he, to be with you. He was therefore in some other or to meet with somebody else. Is that correct? No, no, I'm not sure. I'm just, I'm just saying that's my. He, uh, he came into your office. You didn't have an appointment to meet with him. You don't know whether he had a meeting with somebody else, but he came into your office at Lutri House. Correct. Mm. Yes, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> and that would have been in October. After that, at that particular, well, let's start off with that particular meeting. This is now in October. What exchanges take place between the two of you at that particular, on that particular occasion? Is presumably a discussion of some sort between the two of you. No, uh, the, his, his uh, submission in our first engagement, he narrated the relationship of their business with the ANC, and, uh, but also with MK. Uh, I'm saying that's our association. And, and uh, I think 
His idea was to say to me as a Treasurer General, we also work with your association. So in your engagements, please uh, consider engaging us. So don't uh, maybe hesitate to engage us. So that was, it was not a long meeting. Well, so when he came into your office on that, on that occasion, you were already Treasurer General or you were still to be elected as tre Treasurer General? So I'm, I'm already Treasurer General. You, you had already been elected? Yes. Oh, okay. That's why he started congratulating me for being elected. Yes, okay. Yes. So he might have come to, he might have uh, popped into your office because he knew you had been elected Treasurer General and wanted to convey the message that he conveyed. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Now, you, your understanding, if, if I'm interpreting your evidence correctly, your understanding was that having conveyed the, the message, or having conveyed to you that he was aware that you had, just, you had been elected as the Treasurer General, he started to explain to you that, they, that the, the Gupta family and the businesses had had um, dealings with MK Veterans Association. Was it your understanding from that that he was inviting you, either expressly or impliedly, to engage in business with the, uh, with the Gupta businesses? Correct. <clears throat> and if I understand correctly, he, you then followed up on those invitations. Yes, I think at some stage we, we then started engaging. Now, what stage was that when you say you started to engage with them? No, I, I don't remember exactly if you want the specifics of, of the day and the time, but it, it, it happened uh, because remember it was, it all happened in October. I'm just trying to, to recall. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure if there were any other engagements that took place before I went to meet him again, uh, because uh, there were some uh, uh, programs that I wanted to bring to his attention that needed support of business of MKMVA. So I'm not sure it was uh, before I do that on the 8th, because I know on the 8th I visited him. Oh, so. what, oh, which month, Sorry. 8th of which month? December. 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 Okay. Okay, maybe I'm losing you over here. Um, I'm trying to understand. We were in October, and the meeting that took, takes place in your office, that takes place in October. And then we, when you talk about the 8th, you're talking about the 8th of December. The question that I was asking you is, <clears throat> relates to whether there was interaction between the period of October, the meeting in your office, and the meeting that ta takes place on the 8th of December? No, no, I don't, I don't remember of any interaction. Now, if uh, I... And <laughs> so, is the position that, in terms of meetings, uh, you had a meeting, very brief meeting, when he came into your office, uh, and then the next meeting was on the 8th of December? Is that, is that the position? Or the, were there some meetings between yourself and him in between? What I'm saying, Chair, is that I don't remember if there was any meeting that I held with him before the, the meeting of the 8th. Yes, yes. yes. Oh, but th there could have been, but you, you, do, you are not I, sure. I don't, I don't recall. There because remember, Chair, in my space, I engage various business people uh, yes. to attend to the programs of the organization. Okay, yeah. okay. Now, just to... <clears throat> After the 8th of December, and I'm going to come back to the period before the 8th of December, after the 8th of December, the President tells you that it's his intention to appoint you as the Minister of Finance. On the 9th of December, he removes Mr. Nene as the Minister of Finance, and on the 10th of December, you're sworn in as the Minister of Finance. And then from that period, 
um, up until the 14th of December, you are the uh, Minister of Finance when you get removed of the, as the Minister of Finance and then get put into the position of Minister of Cooperative, Go uh, Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. Is that correct? Yes. Now, in your That's correct. In your position as a, uh, as a minister at this stage, presumably you then uh, have to step down as the national treasurer or the, the treasurer general of the MK Veterans Association. Would that be fair to say? No, it doesn't work like that. I'm still the treasurer general of MKV. So in other words, you continue to occupy two separate posts, one, or <clears throat> one as the treasurer general on the one end, and one as a cabinet minister in two different portfolios on the other. Correct, it's permissible. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> on the, so going back now to these meetings that you may have had with, the, uh, with Mr. Tony Gupta, you're not quite uh, certain at this point in time how many meetings you might have had or whether you had any meetings at all. How much money do you raise during this period of time for the MK Veterans Association, specifically from the Gupta family or the Gupta businesses? What is on record, uh, which uh, uh, I can provide to the Commission, we had uh, one of the first successful uh, uh, golf activity in uh, 2016. Uh, uh, and uh, that they came in as one of the four main, main sponsors of that particular uh, event. One of, I, I, just, I just want to underscore this, one of the four main sponsors of that particular event. And then uh, they followed up uh, also with another sponsorship as one of the three main sponsors for the next golf day because it's an annual event. So all in all, if we are uh, looking at the monetary value, uh, we are looking at plus minus uh, 1.2 million that they contributed to those two events uh, respectively. And, and when did those two events take place, if you are able to remember? Yes, they usually take place around our, our month. We, we have termed uh, December MK month, so they usually take place around uh, mm. uh, December. Both of them? Yes, both of them. Oh, so them. they took place in December 2015? No, no. The first one, sorry, Chair, for not being clearer. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one happened on the December 2016. Mm -hmm. The second one, the December 2017. Oh, okay. 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 <clears throat> now, if I understand, and there was, there was no golf day organized by, amongst others, the... Uh, Gupta family or Gupta businesses in 2015? Or do I misunderstand that? No, they didn't organize Golf Day. We organized our own Golf Day. They came in just as a, a main sponsor. The responsibility of organizing a Golf Day it was the responsibility of my office. I see. Okay, so as a sponsor, they provided no sponsorship in 2015. Is that correct? 2016 2015. and 2017. No, no, listen to my question. In 2015, did they provide any sponsorship in that year for the golf day? No, there was no golf day in 2015. Okay. So the, <clears throat> the first sponsorship, insofar as the golf, uh, insofar as golfing is concerned, takes place from the Gupta's perspective, that is either their businesses or the family, at the end of 2016. Is that right? 2016, yes, that's correct. And the second sponsorship takes place in, at the end of December in 2017, to understand that correctly. Correct. And outside of golfing, or a golf day for the MK Veterans Association, outside of that, they provide no other sponsorship. Is that correct? 
Not really. Uh, in some, you know, the, the situation of military veterans, more especially those uh, uh, who served in the, what we call uh, the former liberation armies, is uh, is is a very pathetic uh, one in our country. Uh, they, 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 are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are struggling to, to make ends meet. So from time to time, they will come to my office requesting this and that. Uh, and uh, I can tell you, I'm dead sure that in one of those instances, or some of those instances, uh, the group has helped. So let me just understand. So people would come from time to time because they're struggling. These are members now, or MK veterans that would come to the offices um, because they need some financial assistance. And on those occasions, you say, you are certain that the Gupta family would have helped? Not only financial <coughs> assistance. Okay, in some I'm cases, sorry. I think you said on some of those occasions. Mm. Mm. Not, not only... Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, sorry, sorry, Chair. Mm. Not only uh, financial assistance, Chairperson. In some cases, groceries, in some cases, building materials, because some of we had to build houses for some of the military veterans. And it's on record. I'm not uh, saying something that is a thumbs up. So I will approach different businesses to assist with materials, to assist with groceries. So they definitely might have played part in some of those, but they are not the only ones. Yeah, but <clears throat> when you say they might have, are you saying that there's a possibility in the realm of possibilities? Or are you saying they might have in the sense that you can't recall, but it's a possibility? I can't recall, but it's a possibility. Okay. Because I know, I mean, uh, that's one thing that you can take away from some of these businesses that associate that with this association. They are very generous in terms of assisting uh, this because they understand uh, that South Africa is where it is because of the sacrifices that these members did. Something that is very difficult for big, big business to understand. Mm -hmm. um, I know that uh, this may relate to an important point, Mr. Ali, but I just want to remind you to keep an eye on time and the, the list of important issues Thank that you, you may Chair. be wishing to cover. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. <clears throat> now, just, just in terms of that um, meeting with the Gupta family, or specifically with Mr. Tony Gupta on the 8th of December, you, if I understand correctly, you telephoned the office to find out, um, you, you made a telephone call to your office to find out uh, what the schedule was for that specific date, in other, sorry, for the 8th of December. Do you understand correctly? I just mm -hmm. want to get a sense of that. No, there was no one at the office. The office, uh, the staff has already closed. So I went there uh, on my own and I phoned the, the Gupta residence. And I was told that the tone is there. So I went there uh, to try my luck because I didn't have a scheduled meeting with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, that meeting couldn't materialize uh, because he was busy with uh, other meetings. So you telephoned Mr. Tony Gupta from the offices of <clears throat> the MK Veterans Association? Correct. And in the discussion, he must have given you some sense that <clears throat> you should come over. I, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to sound to be, uh, 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 what is this, arrogant, you know, uh, but uh, that's not what I said. I've said no, I no. phoned the residents, and the residents confirmed that he's available. Oh, you did not speak to him on the phone? No. Yes. No. And then after somebody had confirmed that he was available, I didn't even you, say... You then chair, proceeded there. Yes, I didn't even say I had a chance of confirming with him if I can see him. Mm. So I was just trying my luck. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, sorry, I must have misunderstood you. I thought it was a scheduled meeting. It wasn't a scheduled meeting. I mean scheduled with Mr. Tony Gupta. No, no, it was not scheduled. Okay. That's how I, by the way, I was supposed to be in, uh, in a holiday with my family, so it, it was not a scheduled meeting. Sure. 
Ja. If we if we can go back to because I'm going to try and bring all of these different issues together at a later stage. Your relationship <clears throat> with Mr. Mohammed um, Bobat. Just explain to the Commission about your history and your relationship with Mr. Bobat. How did that arise? Thank you very much. Sometime in the I think it was early 2019, just before I, I was redeployed to Parliament. Uh, I was, before I went to Parliament, I was the mayor in my constituency. That's a constituency of a mayor form. And at that stage, that constituency was, was falling under the Northwest Province. In Northwest Province, I was the chairperson of uh, uh, South African Local Government Association, the provincial chapter in Northwest, but also I was the, the provincial executive committee of the ANC in the Northwest, but also a member of what we, we call the provincial working committee in that province. So I was doing my outreach program in the region of Pujanala. And uh, if my memory serves me well, uh, I think I needed something or I, I needed to see someone, I don't think I wanted to see someone. I needed something from the restaurant of a hotel which was in the area, in Murule, in the area where I was doing my constituency work. So I went there to, to grab something, and that's where I met uh, Mr. Mohammed. And uh, of course, uh, I got into the restaurant there and I greeted everyone as usual. That's, that's how we are brought up as, as Africans. We greet wherever we go. Uh, so. Then on my way out, I was approached by this gentleman, and then he then introduced himself to me, and then he gave me his business card. And then he told me that uh, what he was doing, the financial uh, markets and all that. And then that's when I started then knowing him. I kept the business card up until I had some challenges with my studies, especially on financial areas. Then I, I started communicating with him on but not necessarily frequently, when there was a need. Now, that's, that's how I came across uh, Mr. Mohammed, or, or Mr. Bobat, because Mohammed is his first name. Uh, which one is the same name? I, when I read documents, sometimes it's referred to, he's referred as Mr. Bobat, sometimes it's Mr. Mohammed. Which one is the same name? The same name is Bobat. Uh, Bobat. Yes. Oh, okay. 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 <clears throat> So that was sometime in 2009. At the time, if I understand correctly, are you saying that in 2009 you were the executive mayor? Uh, I, yes, as I've indicated, yes, I was the executive mayor of my constituency. That's my hometown. It's in Caltonville, Mirafo. Mm. And on this occasion of the meeting, was <coughs> Mr. Bobert provided you with his business card. Correct, Do you know why it is that he approached you? Was there any indication as to why he approached you? Yes, he, he, I think he was in consultants because he was meeting uh, some traditional leaders or people from the royal family, uh, according to him, because I never met those people. Uh, so he definitely wanted to say, maybe I can start thinking. Business people are like that. They immediately hear that there is a leader around. They'll, they'll want to associate with that leader. I don't know how many business cards do I have I mean, in, my, in my collection, because that's how I make business network, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, and if I <clears throat> misunderstand your, your affidavit, then of course you will correct me. My reading of your affidavit was that every subsequent interaction between the two of you, that's between you and Mr. Bobert, was initiated by you, is that correct? Correct. And in each, on each of those occasions, it would have been because you sought advice from him in relation to your studies? Correct. Now, 
You mentioned that you contacted him on several occasions. Was it more than once? Was it more than twice? No, I, I can't remember. It was not that uh, frequent. Was it several occasions? Hey, you know, this thing of quantifying. <laughs> <laughs> A number of times. Yeah, a number but you of can't times. Say how many times. But it was not like uh, something often. that I can say once in a month. No. Yeah. Once in a while, when I needed some assistance like on my studies. Once in three months. Once in six months. Once. Something, something of that nature. Once yes. in three, maybe once in six months. Yeah. Yeah, but it was not a frequent because yeah, it, it was, was it was based on uh, my. My, 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 what I was studying at that time. Mm. And uh, definitely as an expert on tax matters, mm. and as an expert, as an accountant, mm. uh, I derive joy from engaging mm. with him mm. on issues of taxation. Mm. Okay, so you, your understanding in 2009, and based on his business card, was that he was an expert in tax matters. Yes, that's, what he, that's how he presented himself. And, but also, I, in, in my first engagement, I mean, after that meeting, in my first interaction with him about my studies, definitely his uh, knowledge was very evident. <clears throat> now, in your affidavit, if you would turn with me to page 135 of the same bundle that I've given you before, Did you say 155? 135, Mr. Chair. 135. 135. That is so. And there? You say in paragraph 56 that Mr. Bobert and I did not, meet, uh, did not make regular contact, but I can recall once or twice when I called him for some assistance with my academic uh, studies in finance. So according to this affidavit, you met with him or you telephoned him uh, approximately once or twice relating to your studies. Correct. You had no contact with him outside of that, in other words, outside of your discussions about your studies? No, no, no. Uh, but also, if in your affidavit you said uh, uh, once or twice, then that can't be several times. I know that you didn't want to commit yourself to about several times, but uh, uh, if it's once or twice, that, that's much more limited than a number of times, I would, I would imagine. Is that right? Okay, sure. yes, it's very limited. Yes, so, so you, would you say once or twice is more accurate in terms of how many times you contacted him? Yes, I think let's, uh, it, it's, it's more, more accurate. accurate. Let's okay. stick to that, Chair. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay. Then, <clears throat> you, it, you acquired, if I recall correctly, you were at the time studying for an MSc in finance, which you ultimately acquired in 2013. Is that correct? That's correct. But it was not, the, I think it was not only that, because I was also doing something with UNISA on the investment and portfolio management. Sure. And also, economy, I think I did two things with UNISA related to finance. Sure. So, but, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, but in between 2013 and 2015, you had no contact with Mr. Bobert, is that correct? 2000. Between 2013, you've now graduated, you've got your MSc in finance, and 2015, you have no contact with Mr. Bobert after that? No, I can't guarantee that because the real truth of the matter is that I started my lecturing sessions in Parliament to assist the, uh, some members of Parliament, so I'm not sure if I, I was there any time where, where I needed some assistance from him. So I can't definitely say yes. So I'm not sure if I'm understanding the, the response. You say that it was in that time that you started your parliamentary. I didn't catch the word. Look, uh, after completing my, 
by a master's. Uh, I, I took it upon myself, but it's also an organizational duty mm -hmm. to make sure that we encourage others, I mean, to follow the same route because, you know, the financial sector is one sector that is, uh, we, we are not that strong on that sector as, uh, 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 to, to be correct, we are not that strong as, as, as the ruling party. So I took it upon myself to make sure that uh, uh, I encourage my uh, fellow uh, comrades, I mean, to do this course. And uh, I started uh, providing for free, of course, uh, some lectures to them. So I don't know, during that time, maybe I might have needed them because, you know, as you lecture, you need to be brought on your, uh, and uh, you must go deep when you deal with some of these uh, matters. You know. So it's possible that you might have needed him. And when you say you might have needed him, are you talking about coming to assist in providing lecturing, or are you talking about telephoning him for some advice over the phone? No, no, I'm, I'm, I was referring to telephonic engagement. That's why I say I'm not even sure if I ever called him, you know. Uh, but I know from time to time I used to engage with uh, various experts on tax and other, uh, uh, on other economic matters, you know. So on the, on the 10th of December of, or rather, sorry, let me correct that, on the 9th of December of 2015, if I understand correctly, Mr. the announcement has been made that Mr. Nene uh, has been removed. The announcement has also been made that you've been appointed, or you, will be, you have been appointed as the new Minister of uh, Finance and your swearing-in ceremony is to take place on the 10th of December of 2015. If I understand correctly, you don't phone Mr. Bobat to invite him to the ceremony. In fact, the presidency makes that arrangement. Is that correct? Yes, uh, I asked the president to, to try. In fact, I tried to call him from my landline in the office. Then I struggled uh, to get hold of him. Then I ultimately phoned the presidents because they wanted agently a list of people who must come uh, to attend my, my swearing in ceremony. But it was just a handful. And you know, on the 8th, one of the first things that I did after that uh, 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 meeting with the president, because I was, I was obsessed about perfecting this new assignment. So you were upset. I was obsessed about perfecting the new assignment. Oh, okay. So one of the first things that I thought of is whom can I bring to support me immediately? So he's on the eighth effect. I have already decided that I'm going to trace this man because I really need him to come and join me. So just to get that right, <clears throat> you're saying that you were obsessed with perfecting this assignment. And by this assignment, you're referring to your new appointment My new as the appointment. Minister of Finance. Correct, correct, Chairperson. And so, in other words, you wanted to do to excel in this portfolio. That's in the, that's in the nature of ANC products. So we yeah. are, when we are given a task, we want to excel because. Okay. But also, Chair, you know, to be in the executive is not a child's play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> you start to consider in your mind who might you. Uh, get to come and assist you in your new role or in your new capacity as the Minister of Finance and you uh, come upon the name of Mr. Bobat and you decide that he's the person that you would like to come and assist you. Do you understand that correctly? Yes, I do. And you say that you tried to get hold of him telephonically but unsuccessfully. Correct. So you phoned him from your cell phone to his cell phone with the number that you had from the business card that you were given six years ago. Is that correct? Yes. That number is now stored in your cell phone. Is that correct? Yes, it's still there. That's the one that I'm still even using today. And so you phone him and you don't get through to him. But it was not like phoning on my phone. I remember I phoned him from the office, from the two house. 
and I didn't get him, and then because I was under pressure of submitting the names of people who must be invited. So I sent that to the presidency. So you, <coughs> you phoned him from the Tulia house, to understand that correctly? Correct. You don't phone him from your cell phone? I was at the office when this request was, uh, was submitted. But you used the landline in order to It was the landline, him. yes. Yeah. It was a landline. In fact, when I'm, when I'm in the house, I use the landline mainly. But, but so I'm not sure if I'm following you. You say you're sitting in, in the Tule house when you make the call from the landline in the Tule house to try and get hold of Mr. Bobbitt. Yes. You, <clears throat> and at the time, you're trying to do so in order to invite him to do what? What is it that you're trying to invite him to do? I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to notify him that uh, uh, I want to include his name on the list of people that uh, uh, must be invited by the presidency for my swearing-in ceremony. Okay. So it's not your intention at that stage to invite him to join, to join you in any capacity, whether as a special advisor or otherwise? No, in my that thinking, I thought that will require uh, bilaterals with him first. So that's why I insisted that I must meet him first, because over at, I didn't think it was going to be proper for me to discuss such a matter over the phone. No, fair enough. You don't get hold of him. So you then pass on his details to somebody at the president's office and ask them to arrange for him to be present on the 10th of December at the swearing-in ceremony. Is that correct? Yes, I included his name uh, on the list that I forwarded to, uh, to the presidency for invitation on the, uh, uh, for my swearing in ceremony. So you provide them <clears throat> with, the, with his name and presumably his cell phone number as well? Yes, of course. Okay. So in fact, it's the president's uh, the office that phones him and invites him to the swearing in ceremony on the 10th? Yes, that's what he confirms with me. Hmm. But you never have a discussion with him before that? No, no, no about the invitation. I never had a chance to talk to him. <clears throat> about the swearing-in ceremony? Yes, I'm saying about the, the invitation to the swearing-in ceremony. Correct. No, no, no. So when he arrives on the 10th of December, you offer him uh, at, <clears throat> at some stage, and I'll get into the chronology in a moment, but at some stage you're offering him the post of the a special advisor to the Minister of Finance at that, on that occasion, on the 10th of December, is that right? Chairperson, what happened is that uh, I indicated to him that uh, I've got an interest on him being part of my team as my advisor, because the field that I was uh, deployed uh, to, to, to lead uh, will require a person of his uh, 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 caliber in terms of uh, uh, his academic qualification. It was purely on merit. And uh, I further indicated to him that as much as uh, I've identified him, we need to follow a certain process. Uh, because remember, immediately after the meeting on the 8th, uh, with that obsession that I've explained, I had then to go and check how to do it. And uh, I went through the ministerial handbook. Because also, uh, the president, in our meeting on the 8th, that's what he emphasized, go and familiarize yourself with some of these provisions. And uh, of course, among other things, the presidency, I mean, the president indicated to me that I must go through the ministerial handbook. Now, I said to him, uh, according to the ministerial handbook, uh, as an executive, I'm allowed to appoint people to come and work with me. But then, this is the process that we are going to follow. 
I'm going to introduce you to the DG, whom by that time I regarded as someone who's very capable. I hope uh, Mr. Bobat will remember, I said to him, he's a very good comrade, though, and he's very, very efficient. Well, I was not aware that uh, uh, I'm dealing with a hypocrite. Uh, so what happened is that uh, I explained to him that there is a process that needs to be followed for this appointment to be finally finalized. Among other things, you should be vetted because I, I don't uh, even know that uh, you, you, you might say to me you are fit and proper because you don't have criminal records and all that. But there is a due process that must be followed with DPSA and the state security to confirm that you are suitable for this assignment. And the DG is going to help me to complete that process. But you also have to, we must make sure that very soon you sign a contract with myself. So the DG will be in a position to help you with that. So I will introduce you to the DG. And that's what happened. And then he accepted my offer. And that uh, obviously uh, um, made me at least to consider that at least one, one, one of my first, my immediate tasks has been completed. Now, at this stage, presumably, when Mr. Bobert arrives at this meeting, he arrives without any CV, would that be correct? Yes. And in fact, other than the business card, which you got in 2009, you've never seen his CV ever, is that correct? Yes, I've never seen his CV, but I know his profile. <clears throat> when you say you know his profile, what exactly are you referring to? I'm referring to uh, knowing his qualifications, uh, because he communicated those to me, and uh, through my engagement with him, I was able to verify that he's a qualified person. And I had no reason not to believe him when he told me of his qualifications. So when you say you know his profile based upon what he had told you, you're referring now to the period prior to 2015. Is that correct? Sorry, 2013, is that correct? Correct. So on the one or two occasions that you and he had discussions, which were initiated by you, and which related specifically to your studies, the two of you happened to engage in a discussion about uh, his profile. That's what you're saying? That's what I'm saying, exactly. And on those one or two occasions when the two of you happened to engage in a discussion about his profile, he said certain things to you which satisfied you on the 10th of December 2015, that this was the right man for the job. Correct. Correct. In terms of uh, the experience that he demonstrated to me during uh, our engagements, definitely. And <clears throat> you had not at that stage considered anybody other than Mr. Bobert? No. That great? No. He was the person, the only person that you wanted for that job, is that correct? Look, uh, I, I'm sitting as we speak now, I'm sitting with uh, a plethora of CVs in my office. And uh, I have to be realistic because, because at times, you know, when the duty call, more especially at the national level, you will have to prioritize uh, this issue of, uh, of merit. Because the task, I mean, the severity of the task required merit more than any other thing. So I went through some of the CVs of my comrades, but unfortunately, I couldn't find a CV that, that came closer to, to what I, I mean, they was expected of me, or maybe the person to support me. So you sitting in your office, in which office are we referring to now? We talked no, I'm, about... I'm, I'm referring to TG's office. Now, the people's CVs that you're sitting with presumably are people that are from the MK Veterans Association. Not only MK Veterans Association, I mean, from the broader society. Remember, 
I'm not only uh, I'm a community leader. I'm not only a, 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 a TG of uh, MK uh, Military Veterans Association. So, you, <clears throat> if I understand correctly, your testimony is that within the ANC, you're always pursuing excellence. Correct. And in the pursuit of excellence, with the name of a, a person who has told you that he has uh, certain qualifications, you've never seen his CV, you've never verified whether his, the information that he's given you is correct, you then offer that person a job as the special advisor to the Minister of Finance. That's what you're saying. But also, maybe to add on what you are saying, as someone who has demonstrated through my engagement with him that he understands the subject matter. But also, I, I knew, uh, uh, besides me trusting him not to be telling me uh, uh, the lie, I knew that uh, there was a process that I'm going to subject him to, uh, which, was, which, which is normally championed by DPSA. <clears throat> At that stage... I'm sorry. Why did you not want to give yourself a wider choice of people, qualified people, experienced people, from whom to choose? Why did you confine yourself to this person with whom whom you had met only once in six years or so, very briefly, in a restaurant, as I understand the position, and you had talked to, to whom you had talked once or twice on the phone in six years, when there must be many people, some of whom within the ANC, I have no doubt, who would qualify and have experience in relation to financial matters who could, from whom you could uh, make your choice. Why did you confine yourself to this person that, uh, as I say it, you might have a different view, you, 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 whose background you don't know much about? Chair, I had no time because remember I had to, to hit the ground running. Uh, so I had to prioritize some positions uh, in my office so as I can hit the ground running. So in my situation, I then prioritize the two positions because I knew that as I go into National Treasury, it's a, it's a formidable uh, institution. There will be people uh, uh, who can also complement these two that have uh, earmarked. So it was just a matter of prioritizing on my, on my side as to what are the, the, uh, what are the immediate tasks that I need to do or what are the immediate positions that I, I needed to fill. So it was just a matter of prioritization on my side that I needed a, a chief of staff, but I also needed an, a special advisor so I can hit the ground running. So I prioritized him after looking into whatever CVs that I had at my disposal, and I realized that uh, I decided that he's the best, he was the best candidate for, for that assignment. You see, it, it's, it's important for me that I should uh, hear what you have to say on this because it's, it is a, a matter that's, uh, that uh, concerns me in relation to your choice of Mr. Bobert. We'll talk about Mr. Whitley later on. Um, there must be a lot of people who may have been doing the same degree as yourself when you were doing your MSc in finance. There must be a lot of people who are your comrades within the ANC who have um, financial qualifica qualifications in uh, finance. There must be, and who have ex experience, but also you might have given yourself time to talk to maybe Mr. Nene or other ministers uh, and give yourself more time, even if it's a few days, just to make sure that 
not only is the person you choose somebody with academic qualifications, but also that you choose somebody, uh, for example, with integrity. And you don't just rely on what he says to you. You, you talk to other people, you do some background check. Uh, before you say, I am identifying this person, even if the process will involve security clearance and so on. But before you say, I'm identifying this person, just make sure that this is not somebody who, who might have certain skeletons in, in his cupboard that are going to embarrass you, that are going to embarrass the government, that are going to embarrass national treasury. Just say, what are you going to lose by waiting a few days just to check these things? So that's, that, that's part of my concern. You want to address that? Thank you, Chair. Chair, ideally, I will definitely take that route. And uh, I didn't take that route because I felt a lot of pressure, especially how the financial market reacted. So I had to think uh, quickly on uh, uh, getting a team or maybe some people with the necessary knowledge on issues of financial markets. And, uh, of course, uh, knowing him as, as someone that I've engaged, I never had the reservation about his integrity, and I still don't have that. And uh, I never had an issue about his fit for purpose, and I still don't have that. Because remember, we moved. To, I moved with him from uh, National Treasury. We went to Copta. In Copta, definitely, I mean, but that was after even DPSA has confirmed my my own, I mean, intuition that. He's a man of integrity. So definitely, uh, I was under a lot of pressure to make sure that I play my part in terms of dealing with the turbulences, especially in the financial markets that were there at that time. So that's, that's why I immediately had to go for them because of their background, both Mr. Bobat and Mr. Wickley. Mr. Halley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> now, you, you were obviously aware um, in, in 2015, you, you were familiar with the uh, regiment's capital at that stage. Is that correct? Yes, it's correct. And at the time when you appointed Mr. or rather when you made the offer to Mr. Bobert, you were aware that he in fact worked for regiment's capital at the time. Is that correct? No, I was not correct. He only brought it to my attention uh, when I discussed with him at the unit building. And then I then instructed him and he must, if he accepts the offer, he must then resign from the uh, uh, regiment. So I didn't catch that, but you said you only discussed, you, know, you weren't aware of it at the time, but he only brought it to your attention at what stage? He brought it to my attention that he, was, he had a relationship, he was working with regiment at that, at that moment. Okay, in other words, this is at the swearing in ceremony. At the, at the swearing ceremony. And you were familiar with regiment's capital as, <clears throat> what, what was your knowledge and understanding of regiment's capital at that stage? It was just, I didn't have the details about regiment capital, besides that they are, all, they, they are also a player in the financial sector. Were you aware, <clears throat> were you aware of some of the rumors that were swirling in the media at the time? Yes, I was aware. What were the rumors? I mean, about some implications in the certain um, act of malfeasance. Yes. Well, but I don't have the details, but I'm saying I was aware because I, I read business newspapers from time to time. So when he told you that he worked for Regiment's Capital, you were aware of those rumors? Correct. And notwithstanding that fact, and the fact that you were aware of the rumors of malfeasance on the part of Regiment's Capital, you had no concerns about his own integrity. Is that correct? No, no, because he was not necessarily implicated in what was happening or what was said in the newspaper about the Regiment company. You no, know, no, that's fair, fair enough. What I'm asking you is, you're aware that regiment's capital itself 
had been implicated in the media and through rumors in malfeasance. You were aware of that. Correct. You were aware that he worked for Correct. it. And you say that the rumors and the media reports didn't necessarily implicate him. No, no, no. And did you ask him at that stage whether he was somehow involved in any of the malfeasance that had been attributed to regiment's capital? Yes, and then he confirmed to me that uh, he's not part of what, what uh, was said in the newspapers. But also, remember, what said in the newspapers uh, were allegations leveled against regiment, you know? So he also confirmed with me that, uh, but that was not also my, for my focus and uh, uh, my interest then. It was on him accepting my offer of including him into my team. So he says to you, you ask him pointedly, and he says to you, I'm not involved in that malfeasance. So does, from what I, you were saying now, I understand you to be saying, he confirms that there is malfeasance taking place, but he's saying, I'm not involved in it. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying there are reports, media reports, and uh, he's aware of them, but I've never even checked with him to say, are you involved, are you not involved? But uh, he, those reports were all over the newspaper, so he confirmed that he's aware of those reports. Did you ask him if he has somehow been implicated in any of those rumors that are swirling? I asked him broadly about, because thinking of that provision of faith for purpose, I asked him broadly about him having anything that might impede uh, my, uh, obviously, uh, intention to include into my team uh, criminal records or any judgment against him. That, that those are the basic things that I asked him. And then he confirmed uh, that he, he don't have such. Okay, let's put that issue aside. That's a separate question. I'm talking specifically in relation to regiment's capital. What do you ask him about his... You know, that, you know now that he's involved with regiment's capital, he works for regiment's capital. What do you ask him about his involvement in regiment's capital and the allegations, the rumours, the media reports relating to malfeasance within regiment's capital. That's my question. No, it was all about uh, what is reported in the, on the media. And uh, uh, of course, he, told, he confirmed that he's also away. And uh, of course, I mean, uh, I didn't take much interest in pursuing that discussion because uh, he was going to resign from regiment. Was that, oh, let me start by this. Were you concerned in any way about taking somebody as your special advisor as Minister of Finance who was coming from an organization about which there were rumors of wrongdoing? Were you concerned about that at all? Definitely, Chair. That's why I posed the question about fit for purpose, just to make sure that uh, we, we, we don't start a process uh, which, which might uh, uh, backfire. Yes, but I understood you to say what you asked him related to whether there were judgments against him or whether he had a criminal record. And he said, no, he did not have any of that. Is that correct? Correct. Yes, I understood you to say, uh, understood you to be in effect saying to me, your concern was with regard to those issues and not the rumors about regiments. Did I Correct. understand you correctly? Did I understand you correctly? Uh, it, that was also my concern, Chair, yes. uh, because I wanted to confirm if uh, maybe out of that and other things that I don't know of, yeah. he might be implicated or he might be having judgment. So when I posed that question, I was trying to obviously accommodate ev even what is happening at the, at the regiment. You yes. Know? But you see, Mr. Halley asked you directly to tell me what it is that you asked him about the rumors, if you asked him anything. What, what I asked him uh, about the rumors, when he said to me from Richmond, I said, are you aware of the media publications? And said, no, no, I'm aware, but uh, 
these are some of the things that are leveled against my company. So and then I said, no, if uh, then you, you, you accept my offer, it's given that you are going to resign. And you said you would resign? Yes, no, he was going to resign. There was no way in which he was going to yes. continue as my advice and then yes. the future. Yeah. Um, but also, Chair, even if he resigned, he was not going to resign because of what is reported in the newspapers. Yes. No. He was going to resign because he has accepted. Yes. No, I, I understand that. Uh, but from what you say, I get the impression that despite the existence of the rumors of wrongdoing on the part of the organization uh, of which he was part, you were quite content to take him because he was going to resign from regiments, number one. Number two, he said he had no criminal record. Number three, he had no judgment against him. That set you at ease. Is that correct? That, that's correct, Chair. But also, Chair, you know, I wouldn't use that uh, as a basis for determining, including someone. You, uh, let's take for an example. Uh, we have... Uh, well, let, let me say, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. I'm not suggesting at all that you are disregarding his qualifications because you have emphasized his qualifications. I'm not saying you disregarded that. No, no, I just wanted to give an example because the, the narrative that suggests that uh, when a company is labeled as this corrupt or blah, blah company, mm. it's, it's just as allegations, mm -hmm. or even a corrupt company, mm -hmm. uh, when the, an employee from that corrupt company because some companies employ many people who are not even in a decision-making position. Mm. Does that mean when an employee wants a, a job uh, uh, from that company and then having all what it takes for the new job that I'm offering mm. as an owner of another company, mm. does that mean I shouldn't consider him because of the standards of uh, that company where he, he was employed before? Mm -hmm. I will give you a, a typical example. Mm -hmm. The one that comes to mind relevant to the financial sector. In 2013, we had the banks, big banks, including Standard Bank, where Mr. Fuzile is currently working as an executive. They implicated in colluding uh, with other banks, global banks, and manipulated the exchange rate. And in the process, disadvantage billions of customers. And uh, of course, you know, the adversely affected in that situation are the poor of the poor. Billions, uh, because it's a global, it was a global scandal. Now, because uh, Mr. Fuzile, after uh, coming out of national treasury, or becoming a beneficiary of what I attempt, a revolving door phenomena, he went to uh, Standard Bank automatically after coming from National Treasure. Obviously, if, if, if I use that particular analysis of a corrupt company, then I'll just say his integrity is also questionable. Why did he decide to go and join a company? Mm -hmm. So that, that analysis, I don't think it's, 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 it was not going to help me well, to determine. This is where it may be important. Namely, that because the company from which Mr. Bobert was coming, or the, because of the company of which he was part, and the fact that there were rumors of malfeasance around that company, you might have needed to be more cautious and to take some time to check whether you might not be bringing to National Treasury or to your ministry somebody that should not be brought to the ministry. You might have needed more time to investigate before you could say, okay, I'm choosing this one. Because you don't know who in the company may be involved in that malfeasance and who may not be involved. And there may be others, other candidates who don't come from a company that might be having those
types of rumors. And in order to protect the ministry, you might wish to take somebody who seems to have to be not associated with any entity about whom there are rumors of corruption and so on. That, 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 that's, that's, that's what I would like you to address. Chair, so, you know, uh, I don't think it's, it, it was going to be appropriate for me just because of someone is coming from a company where there are allegations, not even substantiated allegations of corruption. I don't think that's going to be important for me to firstly deny that person an opportunity, but secondly, use that as my determining criteria for his appointment because I was under pressure and I knew for the fact that the appointment was not going to be finalized by my identification. He was still going to be subjected to a robust process uh, of uh, vetting to a robust process of confirming his credentials. And that anyone was going to be subjected to that, even if it was not Mr. Bobat that I decided to mm. identify. Anyone mm. was going to be subjected to that. Mm. So, truly speaking, Chair, I don't think uh, uh, that issue at that time mm. was that much of concern, because it was not allegations against Mr. Bobat. You know, if it was against Mr. Bobat, I would have definitely uh, treated it differently. But you didn't know who at regiments may have been involved did you in regard to those allegations no those allegations were not were not citing him no but i'm saying without an investigation as to whether he and other people may have been involved you wouldn't know whether later on it will turn out that he was involved definitely chair and that's why i employed the principle of trust that i had uh, mm. uh, on him and uh, that, uh, of course, considering his uh, qualifications, then I prioritize his, mm. his identification. Of course, the trust that you, were, you had on him was based, among, was based on the fact that you had met, you were meeting this person only for the second time in yeah. your life. Yeah, but we engaged. Yeah, no, I'll come to that. Yes. Two, you had talked to him once or twice on the phone. That's all. Yes. Mr. Kali. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> now, when you spoke with him, you said that he would resign from regiment's capital, but you understood, or presumably you understood, that he held a senior position within regiment's capital, correct? Yes, I did. So, <clears throat> The, the fact that he was going to resign um, would presumably, well, hopefully ought to have provided you with, some, with very little comfort because this was a person that was a very senior employee who had been implicated, or rather, let me rephrase it, whose company had been implicated, on your words, in malfeasance. So he was a senior uh, employee within that company, if I understand correctly. Yes. Now, <clears throat> we are at 524. Um, one less clear that we can go beyond 4 o'clock. Um, Mr. Masugu, uh, is it fine if we go beyond 4 o'clock? Yes, it to it, 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 it be fun. We 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 were quite keen to have. You would like to finish, Mr. Mr. Um, Van Royen set free after today. Yes. Or, okay, so we or, can we can go past uh, four. Sorry, okay, okay, all right. We we have no difficulties. Uh, I I I have in mind that uh, Mr. Halley, you should try and finish by half past four. Thank you, Mr. Chippen. Yes. If we sorry, can, sorry, Chair. Oh, sorry, Chair. Yes. Is it possible that we take uh, a break? We, we can finish today. Yeah. Uh, or because you might re-examine. No, 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 no. I, I will or decide whether to re-examine. But uh, yes, uh, yes. No, no. I think it's possible. Yes, we'll yeah, be happy possible, to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Chair. Yeah, we will. We'll aim to try and finish here. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, the, I'm not sure whether we should take a, a break, but if we are going to try and finish at half past four, maybe we can push up to half past four. Thank and, you. Sir. And if, if Mr. von Royen indicates that he would like a comfort break, he, he, he will indicate. Um, okay, I think let, let's continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and then we'll see how it, how it goes. <clears throat> now let's just move over to Mr. Mabaz, uh, sorry, Mr. Whitley. If I understand your, um, your affidavit or your statement correctly, you met Mr. Whitley for the first time on the 11th of December of 2015. Is that correct? Correct. And you met him at Melrose Arch in the Santon area. Correct. You were present at that meeting. Mr. Whitley was obviously present at the meeting. There was a certain Mr. Malcolm Abbaso that was present at the meeting. And if I understand correctly, Mr. Bobat was also present at that meeting. Is that correct? Uh, what happened is that, Chairperson, I had a meeting earlier at Melrose Arc. Uh, and then the, Mr. Mabaso came with uh, uh, Mr. Whitley. Mm. And, uh, well, I knew Mr. Mabaso uh, because he was working with uh, Minister Zwani, but he was also frequenting our offices at Lituli House. So he then bumped, and uh, not necessarily bumped me, but came to where I was in that meeting at Melrose and uh, indicated that uh, he is aware that uh, uh, I might be in need of support in my office. So there is the gentleman that uh, I might want to consider to come into my team. And I said, uh, let me have an engagement with that gentleman first because I don't know him. So he then gave, uh, allowed Mr. Whitley then to meet with me. Then I, pro I proceeded with Mr. Whitley, and in that meeting, Mr. Whitley presented uh, uh, his CV to me, and then I indicated to him that uh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm very much impressed of his CV, because by then I was looking for someone who can come in as a chief of staff, but also with a knowledge in the financial sector, in the banking sector and uh, that Mr. Whitley had what it takes. <clears throat> and Mr. Bobat, of course, came in uh, because I informed him on the, on the tent that I'll be having a breakfast uh, meeting at Melrose Arc. So he came in uh, and then he said to me, I, he just tendered his resignation and then he introduced then to me Mr. Hood, who was uh, his former colleague, and, and that's why I started knowing Mr. Eric Hood. So, Ms. if I understand correctly, Mr. B uh, Bobert comes to meet you at Melrose Arch because you had told him the previous day that you were going to be having breakfast yes. at Melrose Arch. So you, on the 11th of March, sorry, the 11th of December, when uh, when you have this, this meeting with these various people, you're actually having breakfast at a restaurant, is that correct? No, it was not a restaurant. I was hosted by a business person uh, because that's one of the, the follow-up meetings that I had to wrap up from MKVA. Mm -hmm. So it was not a, a restaurant. It was a, a meeting. It was more of a... I think it was more of a... If my memory says it was more of a boardroom. If, but they served breakfast. It was more of a meeting boardroom. So you're having a meeting at a business, uh, at some premises, business premises, at Melrose Arch. It's not in a restaurant. No, no, it's not in a restaurant. Okay, so you, what's the name of the company that you're at? No, no, no I was hosted by a business person, Mr. Yes. Bashir Saleh, who is a business person from uh, Libya. And this was one of my outstanding meetings, I mean, from uh, uh, MK uh, uh, engagements. Just give me the name again. Bashir Bashir Saleh. Spell that surname for us, please. S-A-L-E-H. That's what I, 
I'm not sure if that's okay. the same name, but I know it's Bashir Saleh. Okay. So you wrap it up with that meeting, and when that meeting is finished, you then approached by Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Mabasa, is that correct? Do you understand that correctly? In fact, that meeting, I didn't wrap it up. It was uh, somehow disrupted by the presence of Mr. Mabasa. So I had to entertain uh, this uh, 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 request by Mr. Mabasa first. Okay. Now, this meeting with uh, Mr. Bashir Saleh, is it in a, it's in, is it in a boardroom? We know it's not in a restaurant. Is it in a boardroom? Or is it in, of a particular company, or is it in the boardroom of Mr. Bashir Saleh himself? I didn't ask those details, but because he is the one who arranged the, the meeting, so I didn't ask those details. Now, Mr. Mabaso approaches you in that meeting. So he, he wasn't aware that you were going to be in this meeting on the morning of the 11th of December, of 2015. Is that right? In my collection, because I never informed him about that meeting. I never informed Mr. Wheatley, because I was meeting him for the first time. The only person that I informed was Mr. Bobat. Was Mr.? Mr. Bobat. Bobat, okay. Yeah. So, Mr. <clears throat> Mabaso arrives at this meeting, in the, uh, which is in the boardroom of a businessman. How is this businessman associated with Mr. Babaso. No, 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 no association at all. So Mr. Babaso <clears throat> arrives there. Do you, is, is this a surprising event? Mr. Babaso just pitches up out of nowhere. He snuffs you out of, out of nowhere. I'm just trying to understand how that happens. Yes, to me, because I didn't inform him. Okay. I didn't inform him. Did, so, did you say you didn't inform him or you did inform him? I didn't, Chairperson, I didn't inform him. You did not inform him? Yes. So he arrives there and he has Mr. Um, Mr. Whitley with him. Is that correct? Yes. And Mr. Whitley uh, comes there. Sorry, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Whitley has his CV with him. Yes. And. Uh, In fact, Chair, let me just indicate that Mr. Mabaso indicated that uh, uh, I'm aware that you might be, as a new person, you might be needing some support in your office. So I have. Uh, uh, someone that I want you to engage with, maybe you might consider him mm -hmm. to be a uh, part of your team. This is now in a telephone conversation with you. No, no, no. This is at uh, Mel Rosak in yes. a meeting that I had. Yes, but yes. I think one of the points that Mr. Hall was trying to establish is how Mr. Mabaso came to know that you were at this boardroom. I, I'm not sure. I, I will be lying, Chair. I don't know how did he come to know. So you, you, had, had, you had spoken to Mr. Mabaso when he told you that there is somebody that you might need to be part of your team, is that right? You had spoken to Mr. Mabaso before he came to the boardroom, is that right? No, no, no. I'm, I'm referring to my engagement with, the, with Mr. Mabaso at that boardroom. Oh. Yes. So prior to him coming to the boardroom, you, he had not, the two of you had not spoken? No, not at all. Not at all, Chair. Not at all. Not that did the only person that not I the, spoke. the previous day. The only person that I spoke to is Mr. Bobat. Yes. The previous day. Yes. Correct. And, 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 and you invited Mr. Bobat to this meeting? Yes, no. breakfast, Mr. yeah. I, I said he can come to, to where I was on our way to the office because yes. I was going to Pretoria from there. Yes, yes. Correct. So at, the, at that stage, did Mr. Bobat knew that you might be needing somebody else when you told him? Yes, yes. I told Mr. Bobat that. Uh, uh, there is a need for me to have a chief of staff because he can't run with the affairs of a chief of staff. Okay, all right. Stay Thank happy. you, Mr. Now, <clears throat> when, when Mr. Whitley arrives there, um, together with Mr. Mabaso, if I understand correctly, Mr. Mabaso says to you, when he introduces Mr. Whitley, he says to you that Mr. Whitley is looking for work, and he may be an asset to, uh, in government. Do I understand that correctly? Yes. So the way in which he introduces him suggests that he is looking for work and may be an asset in government. It seems to imply 
that he's unemployed at that point in time. Yes, no, that's the impression that uh, I was left with too. So, <clears throat> when he arrives there with his CV, armed with his CV, and apparently down on his luck out of, out of a job, you have a meeting with him that lasts for, if I understood correctly, you said it was a very brief meeting. It was, in fact, less than, uh, less than 20 minutes or so. Yes, less than 30, 20 to 30 minutes because I had to go through his CV and then also let him know, I mean, just to check uh, his uh, profile too. And that's what I did in that meeting. And at the end of that, you then appoint a person who you understood was actually un uh, unemployed at that point in time. Do you understand that correctly? Yes, but the person that I've also checked uh, whether his uh, profile is okay. Sure. No. <clears throat> these two positions, let's just consider these two positions. You've appointed a person as your special advisor, that's Mr. Bobert and you've appointed the following day a person who happens to be your chief of staff. That's Mr. Um, that's Mr. Whitley. What salaries do you offer them? The issue of the salary chairperson is, uh, is, is not necessarily my, it's dealt with through the provision, because remember there is a cabinet, cabinet uh, uh, guidance on to how these people should be remunerated and it's given effect through the process of uh, DPSC and that process in the main is an administrative process and that's why the DG will then uh, through his uh, other uh, HR streams will come in mm. and that will be determined in the contract that was going to be finalized between myself and them. But you certainly understand that these positions entail or the salary that would accompany these positions would be in excess of a million rand. Yes. You understood that? Yes, I understood that. What does the chief of staff do? He is the chief of staff in the office. Uh, he uh, obviously looks at uh, my accommodation things. He looks at uh, HR issues within the staff uh, of the minister. He looks into the liaison between the minister's office and uh, obviously uh, stakeholders. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a long list of things that he does, but in the main, the chief of staff's responsibility is to make sure that uh, you, you can say you are, you are human capital related issues within the office of the executive is taken care of, including that of the executive. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> now, I'm going to um, wrap up those issues um, shortly. I want to just deal with one of the complaints uh, that have been raised uh, in relation to the appointment of the special advisor and the chief of staff, and that relates to the process governed by uh, Section 12A. Maybe before you do that, Mr. Halley, because I think that's the procedural uh, issue, issues or issues relating to process. Again, Mr. Van Rooyen, I, I am concerned about a minister meeting somebody that they don't know just having a meeting of about 20 to 30 minutes, looking at his CV only, and offering that person a job as his or her chief of staff without checking any, anything at all about this person. It, 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 to me, The speed 
with which you made these appointments or you offered jobs to these two people or the manner in which, the way in which you went about it uh, is of concern because I would have thought that in regard to Mr. Bo, but somebody that's going to be special advisor to a minister and particularly minister of finance, I would have thought that uh, it should be somebody in respect of whom you proper background checks have been made, not just in terms of uh, knowing the job and experience, but also uh, the type of person that you are taking. And uh, so in regard to both of them, it's people that it seems to me, well, certainly in regard to Mr. Whitley, it's somebody that you don't know. Somebody you don't know. With regard to Mr. Bobert, it's somebody you know slightly, I think. You met him once briefly at a restaurant six years ago. You talked to him on the phone once or twice. And then you invite him to your swearing-in ceremony. Uh, and you offer him a job. So... It just seems to me that that's not what one would expect a minister to do in appointing people to such important positions. Uh, I, I say these things so that you know what's going on in my mind. You, you have already addressed uh, them in some way, but I'm just giving you a chance in relation to Mr. Whitley to say whatever you might wish to say about this concern that I have. Chair, your concern will, is my concern, it will forever be my concern. Uh, but from where I'm seated, I think I did what I could do to satisfy myself about the profile of the two individuals. And I knew, and that's where I'm taking comfort from, that this process was not complete. This was just an identification process subjecting them to a more robust process uh, of fitting them and uh, of also verifying their qualifications, but also it could have been any other person because what impressed me is uh, uh, what was in their CVs. And usually when I, <laughs> I'm given a, a, a chance uh, to, to, to lead because I can use my experience of when I was the executive mayor. I mean, I appointed in the same position, my, my advisor and my chief of staff. These are people that I didn't know, but because of the, 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 what, what, what was contained in their CVs, I gave them a chance, you know, and uh, they never disappointed. But I'm not saying uh, there are no risks attached to my approach. Uh, but I fully agree with you that your concern is my concern too. And that's why I did whatever that I did, but because of limitation of capacity on my side, I might not have done it thoroughly, but also, Chair, uh, remember, I was trying also to, to add value into a, a very turbulent situation. And uh, I had also uh, re uh, relied on the process that was going to follow. I mean, just to confirm if I had the right people. So ideally, according to the section that has just been mentioned, 12, uh, 12A, they were going to be subjected to that particular process. And definitely, that was going to give me the results of my determination. And they, it, it, it did that, because when we went to COCTA, I, I received those results, you know. Mr. Halley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Just to move on to the, the, the 12A, the Section 12A process. My reading of your, <clears throat> of your affidavit, correct me if I'm wrong, my reading of your affidavit was that as far as you were concerned, you are entitled to appoint both Mr. <clears throat> both Mr. Bob, Bobat as well as Mr. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Whitley, and it was the responsibility of the Director General, who was Mr. Fazile, to ensure that the appointment was made. So he didn't have any say in it, and. Once you had made up your mind, 
that these were the people that had to be appointed. It simply had to be implemented. Do you understand that correctly? I understand that correctly, Chair, but that is a wrong interpretation of the provision of uh, uh, the Public Service Act. The Public Service Act is clear. That's, that's on my shoulder. I'm the minister. So identification uh, is subjected mm. to that process of a contract, vetting, and who helps me in that regard? It's the TG. I can't be going to lower departments when I have the accounting officer who is my, my, my chief advisor. I think I like how <laughs> Mr. Fuzile coined his role, because he's my chief advisor. So in terms of giving that effect, it's not me as the minister, I will run around and check, but definitely the park stops with me. Uh, there was no way in which he was going to affect those, uh, the appointments or any accounting office, even the COCTA, uh, if the findings were otherwise. <clears throat> Let's forget about Cocta for the time being. Let's just focus on what happens at National Treasury. Um, or, and as in your position as the Minister of Finance, once you decide that you're going to appoint your special advisor, Mr. Bobat, and your chief of staff, Mr. Whitley, my reading of your affidavit is that that was final. It had to be implemented. There was no need to go to first seek out a security clearance. That was my reading of your affidavit. But correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, you know, English uh, can be very, very tricky at times. Where exactly in the, my affidavit uh, do you read that? Because, uh, Chairperson, as I've explained, I was guided by the provisions of uh, the Public Service Act, Section 12A. So you say if uh, that was his reading, you say that reading is wrong of your affidavit? Extremely wrong. Mm. Okay. Extremely wrong, Chair. Mm. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Can you turn with me to page 128? Of, the, of your statement. <clears throat> I, I found it. So, <clears throat> I want you to turn, um, if you look at paragraph 38 in that, uh, on that particular page, you say they roughly, um, if you read from about line 12 from the bottom, Mr. Fusile derides with cynical contempt my decision. Have you got that? I'm trying to, to find what... Count about one, 12 lines from the bottom. It's in yes, fact 11 lines. Yes. Mr. Fuzili, you say, derides with cynical contempt my decision to appoint a special advisor and the chief of staff to my office, even suggesting that I had acted illegally in making these appointments because, according to him, I was not entitled to do so without his signature. His understanding of the powers of the ministers to appoint their special advisors and a chief of staff is unimpressive for someone who has <clears throat> paraded himself as a paragon of virtue and professionalism. Simply put, I made the appointment as I was entitled to do. His job as the accounting officer was to ensure that my decision to appoint, him, to appoint them was implemented. I refer specifically to Section 12A of the Public Service Act 1994, which makes it clear that the power to appoint special advisors lies with the relevant executive authority. And in case of a national department, the executive authority is the minister responsible for the department. 
at our dad. That was my understanding. Yes, that's a correct understanding. Now you were saying that it was your job to make the appointment and his job to ensure that he simply provided his signature to that <clears throat> to ensure that the appointment was made. That's a, that's the way I read it. With respect, Chair, yeah. this is not what is what is written here. No. Yes. It is not what he has just read. Yes, I he, think I think I think, Mr. Halley, you must put to the witness what your understanding is of what you have just read, or what is, has been read, depending on what point well, you want to make. Well, what I make of it is that, according to Mr. Van Royen, he was the one that was. Uh, entitled to make the appointment, which he had done, and it was Mr. Fazili's job as the accounting officer to ensure that my decision to appoint them was implemented. And <clears throat> he said, so in order to do that, he simply had to sign off. No. I'm sorry. Uh, switch on your mic, yeah. That, that too is incorrect. There's yes. nothing about simple sign. Yes. He'd never said in that affidavit yes. that he had to simply sign. Yes. Why is he must put it, yes. put, put the correct version of what's in the affidavit. Yes. Perhaps Mr. I misunderstand, Ali. Mr. Chair, but I was not entitled to do so without his signature. That's what he says. Sorry? <clears throat> Just read again, Mr. Ali. He says, if we go back to the top, where I was reading from, Mr. No, Fasili I think just derides, read where there is a mention of signature. He says in the next sentence, I was not entitled to do so without his signature. That's what <clears throat> the, that, that's what's been put, or, or rather that's what he's, a, he's attributing to Mr. Sorry, to Mr. Fuzile. He then goes on to say, He's understanding. Uh, hang on one second. Uh, Mr. Fuzile derides with cynical contempt my decision to appoint a special advisor and the chief of staff to my office, even suggesting that I had acted illegally in making these appointments because, according to him, I was entitled, I was not entitled to do so without his signature. So, what's the point you make about his signature? So, do you want to put to the witness? Well, let me break it up into two, Mr. Chairperson. Mm. If I understand you correctly, Mr. Van Royen, you say that you and you alone were, were, were entitled to make the appointment. Would that be fair? That's fair. And you're saying that Mr. Fuzile's responsibility was simply to ensure that it happened as the accounting officer. Is that correct? I, no, that's not correct. Uh, you are not reading what I've written. Okay. Well, let me put this. <clears throat> maybe it's not about the signature, Mr. Van Rooyen. Uh, in 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 this, uh, I think a few lines below that, you say, simply put, I made the appointments as I was entitled to do so. His job as the accounting officer was to ensure that my decision to appoint them was implemented. Uh, uh, I guess if I am to uh, give you my understanding of what Mr. Hall is suggesting is that you are saying once we had made the appointment, Mr. Fuzile as the accounting officer, his job was to make sure that that, that your decision was implemented, in na namely they were appointed, and so on. That's, that's my understanding of what Mr. Halley seeks to establish from you. What do you say to that? Chair, let me explain the process. I identify, but as I identify, the process is not complete. What is going to complete the process uh, is to subject, firstly, through the help of Mr. Fuzile, I will sign the contract with them, because that's an administrative uh, part. Through the help of Mr. Fuzile, uh, they will have to be subjected to VATI. Through the help of Mr. Fuzile, their qualifications and uh, background checks must be completed. So that's what I meant by implementing. 
because I was not going to do that on my own. Mine was just to identify. And then if there was going to be an issue about any of the two, then it was going to come back to me again, identify other people. That's what I mean, Chair. Mr. Harley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Perhaps I'm misunderstanding, but what do, you, what do you understand about appointment? What does that mean according to your understanding? Appointment, uh, it, it means the whole process that I've outlined. It means identifying someone and con obviously taking that particular person through a certain process uh, to confirm his suitability for the position that you have identified him or her for. And then the, that's, that's the complete process of appointment. Maybe I should have uh, uh, explained it in that fashion on my response. Mm. Okay. Mm. If we can move on then. <clears throat> Once again, my understanding, having read through your affidavit, I understood that you were of the view that there was no need to go through a vetting process because, if I understood correctly, you were saying the vetting process is something that takes, uh, and the security clearance is something that takes a long time. And you suggested that <clears throat> because of the urgency of the matter, the appointment had to take place immediately, but the vetting and the security clearance was something that could take place afterwards. The Act is very clear, Chair, that uh, you don't appoint someone who, uh, without the vetting. That's, that's the Act. That provision is very clear. Uh, but practically, uh, what is happening is that uh, People uh, get appointed, and some of them, they are not even vetted for a very long time because of challenges that our state security agency is having. I, I can just give you a, a recent example, which is relevant also to National Treasure. Mm. Are you aware that the DG of National Treasury now, mm. uh, he's a DG with a, a criminal record? I mean, I know your obsession is about integrity and all that. Uh -huh. This is what is happening. Uh -huh. The DG, uh -huh. Mr. Mohajan, as we speak, is having a criminal record uh -huh. of uh, uh, driving, I think it was, it was related to, to driving, reckless driving, some other kind. That's well, what, 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 uh, what part of what you said in your affidavit is that there are other ministers who appoint special advisors, maybe other staff, I'm not sure. Um, also, uh, pending uh, them obtaining security clearance, uh, because you said they, they used to be a backlog with the state security agencies, so people were not going to wait until that process was finalized, so people would uh, start working pending the outcome of uh, this, this state security clearance. That, that, that's part of what I read in your, in your papers. Uh, uh, well, I, I certainly know that, that when the commission started, we experienced ourselves lots of delays with security clearance for uh, investigators and so on, uh, because with the state security agency, uh, it's a matter that uh, we dealt with publicly uh, at the time to say the, the security state security agents was taking long to, pro, to to finish the process. So that that part is something that you have said, and I I didn't understand Mr. Fusile to raise any issue about the fact that there would be some delays with the state security agency. Now, but Chair, Mr. Fuzile came here and didn't lie of what is happening practically. No, no, no. I'm saying I don't remember that he challenged that part of what you say, namely there would be delays in getting security clearance from the state security agency. That part, I don't remember that he challenged that part. No, he did. Uh, I think did he, he only changed when uh, I, sub I supplied my uh, answering affidavit. 
Okay. He raised the issue of uh, getting them doing duties yes. without security clearance. That's why I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, Chair, you know, it, it, it pains me to see people uh, taking advantage of the commission. Uh -huh. Because Mr. Fuzile literally did that. Uh -huh. he, he understand exactly the challenges that you are faced in government. Uh -huh. He understands exactly that people uh -huh. are working there uh, uh -huh. without being infected. Uh -huh. uh, but still, uh, 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 he comes here and say people were allowed to work without being vetted and contradicting himself in the process because he said they were not vetted, they were not entitled to have so-called uh, 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 restricted or confidential documents, but he gave those documents to them, uh, you know. Uh, so, but I'm not there, Chair. I think the, let's yeah. focus on the, 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 the question posed here yeah. uh, of vetting, you know. Yeah. Uh, that uh, vetting is still a problem, mm -hmm. and I don't think it is, it is, it is solved as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, of course, I know some appointments had to be reversed mm -hmm. after people have worked in department for some years. Mm -hmm. Some people even exited the department without be having been vetted. Mm -hmm. Their terms of office come to an end without being vetted. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure since I left mm -hmm. if that particular problem has been addressed. Yeah, okay. Mr. Hanley. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, uh, we, the, I have gone beyond half past four. Shall we try and finish by quarter to five? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, I'm just going to try and run through some of the, mm. some of the other themes before yes. I finalize it and just wrap it up with one final proposition, pulling mm -hmm. it all together, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> there was a meeting with the staff on the 11th of December of 2015, that's with the senior uh, staff. You, you re you'll recall that meeting, it took place at approximately quarter past 11. No, I, ca I, ca I can't recall the exact time, Chair, but uh, definitely the day is correct. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a question about, um, during the course of that meeting, there was a question about whether you According to Mr. Fazili, he had indicated it appeared to him that you didn't really know Mr. Bobert and you, and you got the different roles reversed. You suggested that Mr. Bobert would be appointed as the, <clears throat> the chief of staff and that Mr. Whitley would be the uh, special advisor. You recall the meeting? At which meeting? Because he seems to be confusing these meetings. At which meeting? Which meeting are you referring to, through your chair? That was the meeting where you came to introduce Mr. Bobert and Mr. Um, Mr. Whitley. Do you recall the meeting? I this don't, is, this I, takes place at National Treasury now. I don't, I don't recall that meeting because there was, there was no such a meeting. Let, let me explain what happened. On the uh, 10th chair, uh, I invited uh, through the presidency, Mr. Bobart. And then uh, that was during my swearing in. And then I had, uh, you know, it was, I'm shocked by this uh, 360 degree about 10 of uh, Mr. Fuzile's attitude. I'm shocked, but I'm not surprised uh, because all this is political. Uh, I explained to Mr. Fuzile that, uh, look, I've identified this guy. Uh, to come in and uh, help as uh, 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 my advisor. Please start the process. Uh, if possible, let's finalize the contract so as uh, he can then start doing certain things. But start the process with DPSC uh, as you know it, and he agreed. That was on the tent. And then he agreed, and he never questioned anything. He never even said, maybe I'm wrong or I'm right, you know. He just agreed that I would give effect to it. But cordially, there, there was no this uh, arrogancy and, uh, you know, display of uh, disrespect. No, no, there was, no, there, there was no such. The respect was mutual and was very professional. And I had all the confidence that I'm having one of the best DGs, I mean, to be produced by our city, unaware of this other side that I, I never knew, you know. So, on the, on the, this happened on the 10th, and on the 11th, then Mr. Bobat came in 
after my engagement with him in the, uh, the uh, outlined meeting. Then that's when I introduced Mr. Bobart, uh, Mr. Uh, Whitley to the DG. To I've identified this other person for uh, coming in as much as so he can help me with the office and other things, you know, while I'm still settling, you know. So it, it's not true that I, I, I only introduced uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Bobart uh, on the uh, on the 11th, Mr. Bobat was introduced to uh, the DG, the former DG, on the 10th. It is it was only Mr. Whitley who was introduced on the 11th. No, I think you you actually missed the point. There's a meeting with the senior management um, at the National Treasury, which includes most of the DDGs, the Deputy Director Generals. Now, the question is not whether you introduce in Mr. Bobert to Mr. Fuzile. You are introducing Mr. Bobert and Mr. Whitley to the other people that are, who are at the meeting. Oh, yeah, no, you are right. If, if that, that's what you wanted me to answer, I missed the point. Okay. Now, during the course of that meeting, it seems that, <clears throat> according to, certainly to, according to Mr. Fazile and Mr. Mohajani, they both testified, both state, that you didn't seem to, you, you were uncertain of the identities of these two people. In, resp in respect of Mr. Fazile, he says that you, got, you mixed up the different roles that they were going to play. And in respect of Mr. Mohajani, he says that you kept saying, ah, 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 to use his language, you couldn't get the name of Mr. Bobert when you try to, to, to mention his name. And God help us all. Chair, what, what are you saying? Maybe I should check what, what is the, uh, the leader of evidence saying about this? Mm, okay, Mrs. do you want to repeat your question, Mr. Halley? <laughs> the long and the short of it, Mr. Van Royen, is that you didn't seem to know these two people. You didn't know which role they were going to play, and you, in some instances, you didn't seem to know their names. That's not true. And in fact, Mr. Whitley himself says that <clears throat> you seem to have mispronounced. He also re remembers something to that effect. In his case, he says you seem to have mispronounced their names. No, that's not true. The only time uh, that... I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Mr. Uh, does it not specify, does it not say... Mr. Van Royen seems to have mispronounced Mr. Bobat's name, or I'm sorry, name? Mr. Bobat's name. Sorry, I said their yes. names. It's Mr. Yeah. Bobat's name yes. specifically. Yeah. Pardon me, Mr. Mm. Chair. Mm. Did you see that in Mr. Uh, Mr. Okay, Whitley's Chair. affidavit or statement? Sorry, Chair, for for interjecting. No, I I, I did see that. The real yes. matter is that yes, you know, I've been addressing Mr. Bobat as more in our previous communication. As who? Mo, Mo. Mo. That's oh, Mohammed. That's abbreviating Mohammed. Mohammed. Oh, yes. okay. So, I think the only time, I think he did it even, be, not only in that meeting, where he will want the whole name to be cited. He, he will, let's say, Minister, my, my full name is Mohammed, not Mo, you know? So, it's just to make sure that people don't uh, maybe stick just to Mo without understanding that he is Mohammed. I think that's the only correction that I can do, that I know he, I, I, he used to effect in our engagements with various stakeholders, you know. So it's not like I didn't know uh, his name, I didn't know his name. It's just that I, I was referring to him in our previous engagement as Mo, you know. Okay, because that's how the Mohammeds that relate to me, I call them, you know. Okay. And is it correct that on the 10th of December of 2015 at the swearing in ceremony, when you met with Mr. Bobat, he had indicated to you that he was trying to get hold of you and he couldn't get through. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. That's not correct. No. <clears throat> Chair, may I please, because there's something that was raised about the evidence corroborating, which is not yes. true. Yes, yeah, just deal with it. Uh, if you look into the evidence of uh, both uh, 
uh, the former DG and uh, the current DG and uh, the, the lady, Ms. Ms. Makanda. On that matter, Ms. Makanda doesn't agree with them. She doesn't agree with them. So it's not true that uh, she, she corroborated them. Mm. It's not. Mm. On the so you can weather. see, yes, this is just a, a story that was yes, that went wrong. Mm. You know. You are now referring to Mr. Fuzile's evidence and Mr. and current teachers' evidence that uh, you got the roles the of the two wrong or Correct. their names wrong. But okay. also with uh, the evidence of uh, Ms. Makanda. Yeah, yeah, yes. and you are saying Ms. Makanda's uh, uh, evidence doesn't corroborate what they say. Not at all. Yeah. Okay. Not at all. Okay, Mr. Ali. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> you know, I just want to deal with you about the email that was sent to <clears throat> what, that was sent to Mr. Wood. I, I just want to understand the context. You were aware that that email, as a fact, had been sent uh, to Mr. Wood. I'm talking now about the email um, that had been sent by Mr. Bobat to Mr. Wood and Mr. Issa. What was the email all about, if I may ask? Well, let's just look at the bundle, if you can just bear with me. <clears throat> The email is at page 33 of bundle PA, Mr. Chairperson. Well, do you want to say what it was about? That might... this, this is the email that attached the, the very sensitive, according to Mr. Fazili, attached the very sensitive document that was supposed to go off to Cabinet. If, if, if you want to see it, Mr. Van Royen, uh, we, we can let you see it first, but if you are happy no, no, to I'm deal happy. with it. I'm happy. Okay. What, 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 what was the specific question about that email? The, you were aware that that email had in fact gone off, if understood correctly. Yes. Uh, I must indicate, Chair, uh, maybe I should uh, give a background of how these things are uh, processed. Uh, I think there was a submission that was required of me as the minister. So I then said uh, to the DG, please share this information with us so as I can enrich my submission. With whom? With, with myself. Oh, so as I can you enrich. asked the DG to share the information with you? Yes, but yeah. of course it will be through my... Your chief of staff. My chief of staff. Okay. You know, because they had to work on, I think it was a speech. Yeah. or my submission to a presentation to, to Parliament, I'm not sure. Yeah. So, usually what happens, if documents are not classified, because that document was not classified, there's nothing that stops me or even the DG to solicit input from experts to enrich that document. And it's not true what the DG said to this commission, that uh, National Treasury doesn't consult stakeholders. No. It's wrong. In fact, it's even wrong in terms of uh, the legislation that are, right, that are governing, I mean, uh, uh, national treasury, as well as other departments of government. Because we rely on inputs from stakeholders to come to determinations. We don't operate from a vacuum, you know. And uh, I can cite the example of programs that have been championed by national treasury that clearly demonstrated that uh, a national treasury engage stakeholders even the minister engage stakeholders before they make submissions, even themselves, before they come to parliament in some cases. They share information with stakeholders even before they come to us mm. to present, when I was still in the, in the finance committee, mm. to present, on, and they will tell us, mm. this is the inputs that we have solicited from mm. stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So it's not correct that uh, National Treasury doesn't engage stakeholders. It's, it's a wrong impression of our democratic government. Well, it might be a question of at what stage, what process happens. I can't imagine that in a government department or any government department, the position would be as long as a document is not marked 
or uh, is not classified as top secret or is not classified, you can share it with anybody. I don't imagine that that, that would be correct. Is that what you are suggesting? That as long as it is not classified, uh, it can be shared with anybody outside of the well, department? Chair. Chair, if there is an emphasis of not sharing, then it will be indicated either through the communication channels or either through whatever means. But ideally what is preferred in government and what is promoted is marking this document as they originate. You know, you don't release a document uh, where you don't have an intention of sharing it and you don't mark it. You, you must mark that document. Well, what about this? Because this is what I would think. I would think that within a department, uh, the people who work there may have an idea that even when a document has not yet been marked or classified, it must still remain within the department. And then there may be certain people within the department who may have authority to say we can share it with so and so, but not with so and so specific people, and then it might you might come to a stage where it's classified. Then at that stage you say you share it with nobody except maybe cabinet minister, deputy minister uh, only. So. I, I suspect that there must be stages of any document. Uh, would, would it not be like that to say uh, the DG might decide I can share it with the DG of another department, but I'm not going to share it with, with my brother who works in the private sector, even if he's my brother, because of the content of the document. In that situation, I think the DG will notify the other DG that this is between the two of us, because it's not marked. Because if it's marked, then it gives it give clear guidance from the word go from any person who lay his hands on that document, that this is not for public consumption, you know? But in this case, we, we have a DG uh, who didn't even indicate in the email that no, this document, this information that I'm sharing should not be, uh, you shouldn't solicit input from any other pe person besides internal, you know? But also, you know, what is interesting in the submission of Mr. Fuzil, he claims that if people were not vetted and they were not fit and proper, but he went on without being worried uh, of sharing what he termed uh, a confidential document. In fact, he does not even say it's confidential. He says top secret, you know? So really, really but he says, he says, and you would have heard him because he was here when he said this, he said the minister had arrived with these two people, special advisor and chief of staff, and now I'm paraphrasing what he said, as I understood it, whether we liked it or not, we had to work with them. Uh, so I had to work with them pending whatever process that, that was my understanding of the point you, he was making. Okay, which is wrong, Chair. Because a, a, a DG, well, I'm not going to separate a DG of uh, National Treasury and other DGs. A DG is a DG in government. A DG is a chief advisor of the minister. There's no way, not unless he, he was there to set me up, you know, and something that I was not aware of. Because uh, if it was enough of that, he could have said to me, you know, at some stage I even called Mr. Fuzili my comrade because I think he was so good in terms of deceiving me, in terms of uh, who he is, you know, because I call him my comrade. So, but that, that's, that's, that's neither here nor there. The key issue here is that as an accounting officer, you know, immediately that is found that the minister did something wrong. I mean, you should be worried because then you didn't do your work because your work is to advise the minister. You can't, you can't come and use this thing of a, a political, uh, uh, political cloud as a reason for doing, uh, allowing the minister to do wrong things. Then that national treasury was in trouble. That national treasury was in trouble, uh, Chairperson, if really that was uh, his attitude. But of course, 
Mr. Van Royen. Mr. Halley referred us to paragraph 38 of your statement where you make it quite clear that his job was to implement your decision. That doesn't seem to me to reflect an attitude of flexibility on your part in regard to this point. It appears that your position was, DG, you implement. I've made the decision, you implement. That, that's the impression I get. I'm sorry, Chair, you, you still have that impression, even if I went to town to explain uh, uh, what I meant by implementing. No, 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 I, I accept that you, you explained, but I'm just saying, as you make the point that you have just made, namely, he should have come to you if he thought the minister had done something wrong. I'm just saying, let's remember that there is this point that you made, but I'm not forgetting the explanation you gave earlier. Maybe, maybe I made a, a, a mistake by not indicating that in my discussions with him, this is what I emphasized on. Please, to complete the process of implementation, take these people through this process. It's not an implementation of a, you know, a military command, no. It doesn't work like that, Chair. Because if I'm, not, I'm going to work in a department without the support of the DG, the department will collapse. And I'm not, I'm not thumb psyching here, Chair. I've seen sour relationship between ministers and DGs collapsing departments, you know, or holding uh, important programs of department at Ransa, you know. So I, I had a clear understanding of how I should relate to this person that I looked at as my comrade, you know. Thank you. Mr. Thank Harris. you, Mr. Chair. We <clears throat> almost finished. If we can just make um, one or two additional points, just to confirm, according to Mr. Whitley, you, <clears throat> the meeting that took place on the morning of the 11th of uh, the 11th of December of 2015, when you were, when you uh, invited him to join as the chief of staff. Mr. Esser was present at that meeting as well as Mr. Eric Woods. Now you've confirmed Mr. Woods's presence. Is it correct that Mr. Esser was also present at that, on that occasion? No, I don't, I don't remember Mr. Esser. I, I remember having a, a, a quick engagement with Mr. Woods as he was in, uh, introduced to me by, by Mohammed. I don't remember seeing Mr. <coughs> because remember, I didn't have a meeting with this gentleman. I had a meeting with uh, Mr. Bashir and then the day was Malcolm sure. coming. I, the only person that was, I was expecting to come and maybe uh, to, to talk to me before we go to Pretoria was uh, Mr. Bobat. Mr. Chair, <clears throat> there's a, some very important question that has arisen um, that's been drawn to my attention. I need to take an instruction on it. It is yeah. quite important. Okay. And I'd like to chat with my, uh, my junior as well as Mr. Fazili's. Well, I have some I? questions for Mr. Van Roy, and I don't know whether, while I ask him some questions, that will give you that chance or not. Um, if I can do it while you're busy, ask it, please. Yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That, that's fine. Uh, Mr. Van Roy, uh, if I recall correctly, the, the public protector's report that is. Um, Ms. Tuli Matonzela's report uh, seemed to suggest that prior to your appointment as Minister of Finance, you or the cell phone record suggested that you had been in the vicinity of the Gupta residence of Saxon Weld quite a number of times. Correct. Is that correct? That's correct, Chair. And that's yes. what I confirm also in my statement. Yes, okay. yes. No, I asked that because earlier on, understood you to say you, you were only able to remember that you met Mr. Tony Gupta, that is Rajesh Gupta, uh, at the office when he popped in and on the 8th of December, uh, which seemed to suggest to me that you might have met with him only twice before your appointment. Um, so, so you are saying uh, yes, it's you, 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 you were in the vicinity of the Gupta residence a number of times prior to your appointment. Is that correct? Or in the residence? I just want you to clarify. 
Yes, in, in the residence chair, but what I've said is that because I think the question was any phone call that yes. happened between uh, the, the, the two dates. Yes, or, or so then, 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 then what, what I said here, yeah, that's what I, I responded to is that I don't remember of any oh, uh, okay. besides those two, yes. and that doesn't imply that there was no any phone calls. But as I've responded in my statement chair, yes, uh, it, it, it went beyond just what is uh, recorded in the public uh, protector report. Yes. There were other meetings even beyond that. Yes, okay. but, but are you talking now about the period prior to your appointment or are you including after your appointment? No, when I'm talking say... after my appointment, when I say even beyond. Oh, okay, all right. Yes. But um, uh, before your appointment, uh, how many times did you, would you say you may have visited the Gupta residence? I, I will be like I can't remember from my head. Uh, the would it be head. would it be fair to say many times or several times? Would that be fair or would that not be fair? I just want to you get see, that a quantification. Picture. That quantification chair is giving me a problem. But definitely, uh, it was not like a frequent thing. No, it was yes. not like a frequent. Not unless there is something that needed yeah. need to interact with them, yes. uh, needing their support. But it was not like maybe you know, like five times, four times. No, I can't. I, I really can't remember. You can't sure. say, but can't a number say. of times. Yeah, a number of times. Okay, all right. Yeah. Whenever you went there, did you always uh, meet with Mr. Tony Gupta, or did you meet other members of the Gupta family? No, at some stage, uh, uh, he introduced me to uh, some members of their companies. Yes. Because remember, I had to work with their companies to finalize even sponsorships and all. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, did you ever meet Mr. Ajay Gupta? No, no, no. no you no. never met him? And uh, met him. Mr. Atul Gupta, did you ever meet no, him? No, no, I've never met him, Atul Gupta. Yes. So would it be fair to say the only uh, member of the Gupta family that you met was Mr. Tony Gupta? It was Tony, yes. Yes. Um, is it correct that you only met Mr. Tony Gupta for the first time when he came into your office at Lutuli House, as, as you indicated. Yes, Chair. And you said that was in October 2015. Yes, October 2015. Yes. You, you couldn't remember the date earlier on, and I don't expect you necessarily to remember it now, but are you able to say maybe it was the end of October or early October or mid-October? No, Chair. You I, can't I, say. I, I'm unable to say. No, that's, fi that's fine, but it was that. October. Yes. Yes. Now, the matters that you discussed with him, uh, were they confined to how his companies or their companies or he could assist um, your members or did you discuss other businesses or other issues or even political issues? Chair, part of my uh, mandate, besides just looking for uh, financial assistance or assistance in kind no, uh, is also to uh, ensure that I assist businesses of uh, military veterans mm -hmm. to have partnership with other businesses. Mm -hmm. So I know one of the things that uh, uh, I was uh, discussing with him was uh, how to support mm -hmm. some of our military veterans companies. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, it went to an extent of uh, uh, just on the brink of sealing a deal of some of our guys in all the nine provinces distributing, mm -hmm. getting uh, what their companies distributing their publication. Mm -hmm. Because remember, they had a publication. Mm -hmm. And of course, they were going to be empowered with uh, vehicles and all that. Mm -hmm. But that would be as a startup for mm -hmm. them to run their own distribution entities. Mm -hmm. So we discuss uh, uh, also options of supporting mm -hmm. companies of military veterans. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, Mr. Tutuzana Zuma said when he testified before me that uh, Tony Gupta is his big friend. Was Mr. Tutuzana Zuma with Tony, Mr. Tony Gupta at any of the stages when you met with Mr. Tony Gupta? No, no, no. At no stage did I meet. Was I, I meet to Duzani, not with Tony Gupta. I meet yes, to Duzani yeah, it's, it's, it's other platforms. Yeah. Yes. Correct. And, uh, and on the 8th uh, of December, that is now the day on which 
you were to meet with the former president in the evening, as I understand your position. You said you went to the Gupta residence, is that right? Yes, I, I, want, I wanted to, to have a session. You wanted to? But if I remember, Walsh, I had the pressure from certain, uh, certain members. Sorry? Because, you know, I had pressure from certain members of assistance, so yes. I wanted to check if yes. I can be assisted to assist. Yes. yes. But did you say you actually did not meet him even though you did go to the residence, Gupta residence? No, it, it never happened. Uh, it never happened. Because uh, he was held up in a meeting. I think I waited for some time there. Yes. Do you remember whether it was in the morning on the 8th when you went there or in the afternoon? It might be midday or oh. just after lunch, around that time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So ultimately, that whole day you didn't meet him? No, 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 no. Yes. I mean, after that failed meeting, then I... Yes. And did I he speak through. to you at some stage to say, I heard that you came to see me, but uh, you had to leave without seeing me? Did he phone you to talk, to talk about that? Look, I can't remember exactly, but I think it will be obvious that when in, if I, I, I happen to meet him yes. after, I yes. might have raised that, but I oh. can't vividly uh, remember if I did it. Yes. But you, you say nobody, uh, or rather, you say he never spoke to you about your possible appointment as Minister of Finance. No, no, not at all, Chair. He not never all. discussed not that. Not at all. Never. Did, Remember, even when I was there, I was not even aware yes. that I would be assigned yes, you yes, know, uh, to, yes. To, 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 yes. to the executive. Yes. You know? I was still, I mean, in that darkness of yes. what is exactly going to happen. Yes, you know? yeah. yes, yes. yes. Um, let me, I'll come back to that. With regard to Mr. Mabasso, how long had you known Mr. Mabasso uh, by the time he introduced Mr. Whitley to you? I think when Minister Zwani started uh, as a minister, because I was already in parliament, mm. so, and I was uh, the whip of uh, economic transformation last month, and mm. uh, the committee of uh, uh, minerals and energy. Uh, in terms of our study group arrangement, mm. uh, uh, it falls even currently still like that. It falls under that cluster that I was the whip of. Mm. So of course, when we engage, but also not not only that, I was also in the the, the party strategic committee, strategic committee in parliament, mm. and that's a committee that holds the executive accountable. Mm. So when we engage with ministers, that's how we get to know those who support them, mm. and then. Uh, I think it started when the uh, minister, uh, uh, minister Zwane was then confirmed as a minister. That's when I started knowing him as we interact in parliament or as we interact in ANC platforms or any, any, uh, any other way. Would that, would that have been in 2015? I have, I have a suspicion that no, no, minister, minister Zwane may have become minister of mineral resources in 2015, but I may be mistaken, maybe 2014. No, maybe, was he the first, I'm, not, I'm just trying to think, no, well, I think I he, he became the minister before it, it, If I recall correctly, when he became minister of mineral resources, he was replacing uh, Minister Ramatlodi, and I think he was being minister for the first time, Minister Zwane. Okay, that, no, that, that's possible, but what I'm trying to, to, to yeah. narrate here is that I started knowing him uh, through his working yes. relationship with uh, Minister yeah, So Zwane. you would have known him maybe the same year, the 2015 or the year before or something like that? No, not for, no, no, for no, many not the year before. It, it happened in uh, my introduction to, to Mr. Mr. Mabasso. Mabasso. It, was, uh, it happened immediately or maybe after uh, Minister Zwani oh, okay. was confirmed as a minister because okay. then we, we, we had to interact Yes. I mean, to obviously get assistance from the Ministry for our organizational yes. okay. work. Yeah. Okay. Now, I think you said that uh, on the 8th, after the President um, had informed you that he intended appointing you as Minister of Finance and to remove Mr. Nene, you began to think about who you would uh, bring on board to assist you. Is that right? On the 8th, after oh, my engagement. On the 8th, after my engagement with the president. Yes, and the right. engagement you, you said was in the evening, is that right? Yes, it was in the evening. Yes. Now, in your own mind, uh, did you decide at that stage that 
one of the people you should bring on board was Mr. Bobat. It didn't happen immediately. I had to check. To, yes, to check, yeah. On to but he was that, one of that the was people. at my disposal. Yes. So definitely, uh, yes. that's when, uh, when I realized that I don't have anything at yes. my disposal, then that's when yes. I thought of him. Um, is there anybody that you shared this information with once you had an intention to uh, appoint Mr. Robert? Is there anybody that you shared this information with before making the offer to Mr. Bobat? No, no, not at all. You did not share not it? All. Not at all. Not That's why even I was hesitant even to share it uh, with him over the phone. You know? Sorry? I'm saying that's why I was, I was, I, I said it was not going to make sense for me yes. to share. If, if I managed to, 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 to get hold of him, yes. I was not even going to share that with him over the phone. Yes. Then that's why uh, I waited for uh, that uh, moment at the union building yes. For, for, yes. for me to discuss with him about uh, my intention. Yes. Is there anybody uh, that you approached uh, on the evening of the 8th uh, of December and maybe in the morning of the 9th or during the, during the day on the 9th, is there anybody with whom you shared, you, to whom you said, I need uh, people who can assist me, I need an advisor, I need a, a chief of staff, is there anybody that you spoke to and said you wanted to be assisted um, on this issue? No, no, it only happened up until I... Uh, after the swearing in? After the swearing in. Yes. That's okay. when, uh, yeah. But after the swearing in, uh, when you made the offer to Mr. Bobert, you, you had not shared your intention with anybody, had no, no, you? No, 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 no. You sure. had not. Not at all. And not obviously, all. because you had not met Mr. Whitley, you couldn't have talk to anybody about intending to appoint Mr. Whitley. Correct. Yes. And you only met Mr. Whitley the following day, namely the 11th, the following morning. Mr. Whitley. I you met on, him on the 11th. On the 11th in yes. the morning. Yes. yes. Now, what I find strange, and I would like you to comment if you may, is how it is possible that Mr. Enoch Godungwan already on the 9th tells Mr. Fuzile that he was going to get a, a minister who would come with two, no, maybe he didn't say two, but we would come with advisors that he did not know. Now I'm saying that because you didn't come with one min, one one person, you came with two people, a special advisor and a chief of staff. And we know that with regard to Mr. Whitley, you actually didn't know him until the 11th. And with regard to Mr. Robert, we know that you knew him very slightly, as I understand the position. So I ask myself the question, how would Mr. Enoch Kodongwana have known about this ahead of it happening. If uh, you were the only person who, who, who had the names of people you wanted to appoint and who, who knew you were going to appoint uh, advisors uh, and arrive with them at National Treasure, well, how would you, somebody else have known that? Are you able to say anything about that? Chair, I, I looked into Mr. Kodongana's uh, affidavit because I was expecting to hear something that I don't know. Uh, that simply suggests that I'm, I'm equally in your position. I don't know how did Mr. Ino Kodongana, because what he's saying here, he's speaking of speculations, and Romas, but also he's speaking of the meetings of the NEC, what they were discussing there about a, a, a possible reshuffle. So as to how that uh, uh, may 
him to be such confident that uh, this is what happened. I'm still waiting to hear from him. Because truly speaking, I really don't know. I really don't know, Jay. Yes, but you, 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 you understand where I'm coming from. He says, upon arrival at National Treasury, you are going to come with, or maybe I'm being inaccurate, you know, but I think he says, if I recall correctly, to Mr. Fuzile, according to Mr. Fuzile, you are going to get a, a, a Gupta minister. Let's leave out the question of a Gupta minister, not a minister, not a Gupta minister. Let's say you are going to get a minister who is going to come with, with advisors that he doesn't know. And here you come to Treasury with two people. Certainly, Mr. Whittle, you don't know, you've just met. And Mr. Bobert, as, as I said, you know slightly. Uh, that suggests to me that the information about who you are going to come with, who you are going to have as your advisors, he, he was known somewhere else other than by yourself. Chair, I, I can't because I was not, I'm, I'm not yes. part of wherever yes. Mr. Kodongwana got that information. Yes. So I, I really can't answer for Mr. Kodongwana. Yes. Yes. No, no, no. I understand that. I, the reason I'm putting these things to is to get the benefit of your comment because they, 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 they are in my mind to say, how did he know? And that, of course, arises because there, 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 is, there is the suggestion that you may have been given these people by the quotas. You see, that, that, that's, that, that's the context. But let me, put, let me also put this other factor before you, and you can comment uh, if you are able to. I had Mr. Jonas's evidence last year, and he spoke about a meeting that he had at the Gupta residence. And that meeting took place on the 23rd of October, 2015. Uh, you remember you said, um, Mr. Rajesh Gupta came to your office in October 2015. Uh, Mr. Jonas said he had a meeting at the Gupta residence with one of the Gupta brothers. He was not sure which one, as well as Mr. Duduzane Zuma and uh, Mr. Fana Lokhlongwane. But the investigations that have been done by the commission suggest that um, only Tony Gupta may have been present in the house at the time in terms of the Gupta brothers. Um, Mr. Atul Gupta seems to have been out of the country. Mr. Ajay Gupta seems to have been in, in the Sentinel office. And Mr. Duduzane Zuma and Mr. Shlongwane confirmed that Mr. Tony Gupta or Rajesh was in the house, but they deny that he was part of the meeting, but they they say he popped into the meeting and wanted to say something to Mr. Tutuzane Zuma and left. But Mr. Jonas evidence that his meeting actually was with uh, the, the Gupta brother that was there. And uh, he says in that meeting, the Gupta brother was there, told him that Minister Nene was going to be fired as Minister of Finance. And we know that indeed, in about six weeks' time, Mr. Nene was fired as Minister of Finance. And one of the things that he says they said to him, they said, oh, they said to him, according to Mr. Jonas, uh, Mr. Nene was going to be fired because he was not working with them with the Gupta family. And they wanted Mr. Jonas to work with them as Minister of Finance. They wanted him to take the position of Minister of Finance. And they said to him, the old man likes you. And he understood that to be a reference to President Zuma. And he says, they said to him, 
When he becomes Minister of Finance, they could supply him with personnel, including advisors. And there you come to replace Mr. Nene after he has been fired. And you come with advisors, an advice, special advisor and chief of staff. One, you don't know, you've just met. The other one, you know slightly. And Mr. Inok Kotungwana has known before you even met uh, Mr. Whitley that you are going to come with, as he put it, advisors that you don't know. That, 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 that seems strange. And add to that, Mr. Temba Masego's evidence, which he gave before me, that in some time during the second half of 2010, he met with Mr. Ajay Gupta at the Gupta residence. And one of the things Mr. Gupta told him is, anyone who doesn't want to work with us, any minister who doesn't work with us, will we'll get the, uh, the, the president um, I can't remember whether he said to deal with him, but basically it was we would report that person to the president and the president would, would act. And of course, Mr. Masego, he was not a minister, he refused to cooperate with them and he was fired. Not fired, he was transferred from one position out of the government communication service. And when I look at the evidence that has been laid so far before me, his transfer seems uh, to be very un unusual. The president, Mr. Zuma, says he never gave instructions that he, sh he should be fired or transferred. Um, Mr. Masago says, well, my minister told me, President Zuma said, by the time he comes back from outside the country, I must be I must be gone from this position. So there are all these things. I know that you did not appoint yourself, okay, as Minister of Finance, but I'm, 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 I'm mentioning these things to you in order to, to see what I am looking at as I listen to your evidence and as I listen to Mr. Fuzile's evidence. And uh, wanting to answer the question, what are the chances that maybe without your knowledge, uh, you were appointed, maybe at, at least in part because of any influence from the Gupta, from the Gupta family. You might not be able to say anything to some of these things that I'm putting to you, but I'm just letting you know what's going on in my mind. If you have something to say, feel free to say it. Chair, indeed, I'm not uh, uh, as, uh, that much uh, taken aback by your perplexity on how these developments happen. But the reality of the matter is that uh, all these things, I mean, uh, they should be, as you know, the appointments and uh, the dismissals or the, uh, absorption of people, those are procedurally guided uh, 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 processes. So if there's any deviation uh, on the those, uh, definitely I think that should be the focus of, of this particular commission. But truly speaking, uh, I'm, I'm equally surprised how did it happen because the root of the matter is that uh, the president is the only power who is empowered to appoint ministers. So there's no way uh, in, my, in my submission, that's, that's something that I've made clear in my submission, that uh, that could have been done by any other person. But also I'm just, uh, uh, did concern that uh, anyone can then consider such uh, particular allegations or maybe such particular claims to be claims that can be used to accuse any other person without checking the process that was followed to give effect to certain appointments. But coming to my situation, Chair, as to how I appoint people that I didn't know, look, this issue of it, it might not even have been even them, uh, Mr. Bobat or Mr. Ian. It could have been any other person. 
I didn't use the, the issue of knowing someone as my guiding principle. What, what, what is driving uh, uh, my decision on this matter? Uh, what, what drove my decision on this matter? is uh, the merit that I see in their, of course, on their profiles and ultimately in their CVs. That's the only thing. And that's something, that's the very same approach that I could have uh, used in appointing any other person. Of course, I mean, I'm, I'm fully considerate of the limitations that you have raised, but as I've said, uh, I, I definitely believe in the process that was going to follow to finalize those appointments. So. I didn't use the issue of knowing or not knowing uh, as the basis. Otherwise, if I am to follow that, Chair, uh, because I, don't, I didn't want to, usually I, I, I want to stick to the provisions of the National Development Plan. We need a capacitated state. So we can't capacitate state with cronies and friends. We need merit. And that's what, that, that, that's what made me to take a decision on those two appointments. And I can tell you now, Chair, if I continue to serve in National Treasury, I was definitely going to check uh, what is happening with these other positions? Because at the end of the day, it's all about service delivery, you know? And uh, that's the same thing that I did in, in Copter. I arrived in Copter, I checked, and I retained. Uh, where, where it was not possible, I didn't retain. But in the main, I retained because there was quality there, you know? Thank you. Mr. Halley? Chair, it's just... <clears throat> you had uh, about one question more. Yeah. Um, I want to chat with you about... Mr. Bashir Seller that you met with before your meeting with Mr. Whit um, <clears throat> Whitley. What did, <clears throat> where did you meet Mr. Seller previously? How did you get to know him? Uh, I got to know Mr. Seller, uh, if I remember well, they requested a meeting with our office. That's how I got to know him. Because I'm reading here about reports in the media which suggest that Mr. Seller was the... Sorry, sorry, Chair. He is reading from the media. Mm. My client has not seen what he is reading. Oh, he yes. cannot be reading from the media and putting questions that he's reading from the media mm. to a client who has taken an oath to give evidence before this commission. Mr. Halley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Mr. Van Rooyen has mentioned a person. Insofar as reading from media reports is concerned, there's no reason why the Commission should not receive media reports. Obviously, it will have to be made available. But I would like to find out from, from Mr. Van Rooyen uh, if he's aware of these media reports relating to Mr. Seller. Mr. Mr. Seller, remember on the 11th of December, yes. he has a meeting <clears throat> with Mr. Whitley. Yes. Mr. Before that meeting, mm -hmm. according to Mr. Van Royen, mm -hmm. he actually has a meeting with a businessman. He identifies the businessman mm -hmm. as <clears throat> Mr. Mr. Uh, Bashir Seller. Mm -hmm. Yes, so what, 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 what is the point about he, Mr. Seller? Well, according to the media reports that we read in, it seems that Mr. Seller was identified as a financial backer, or the right-hand man of Mr. Muammar Gaddafi. Were yes. you aware of that at the time? But, but, but what, what, why, why is that relevant? Well, we want to just explore that with him. He had the meeting with him. He had yes, a meeting but with to him what end? To what end? If he met somebody who says seems to have known Gaddafi, and so what? Well, we want, to, we want to ascertain what was the relationship between him and, the, and Mr. Mr. Van Rooyen in his capacity as the, uh, the, treasurer, the, the treasurer general of the MK Veterans Association. And how will that help us in looking at the issues we are looking at here about his own appointment and the appointment of the advisors? And I just thought we, we ought to exploit in the context yeah. of the larger context of what we're dealing yeah. with, Mr. Chair. No. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Then, if I could just wrap it up, uh, Mr. Chair. What we know from what the, some of the issues that Mr. the chairperson has raised with you in relation to the evidence of Mr. Nkabisi Jonas is that 
in October of 2023. Uh, I, I will let you I'm ask one, one question to wrap up, yeah. I mean, I'm putting what our oh, argument will okay, be. Mr. Okay, okay. Mr. Mkabisi Jonas says that he's offered the post of the, <clears throat> um, offered the post of Minister of Finance on the 23rd of October of 2015. We know from your testimony that in October 2015 you in fact meet with the <coughs> meet with Mr. Mr. Gupta, Tony Gupta. We know also that on the 8th of October, sorry, the 8th of December of 2015, you meet with the president in the evening in which the president tells you that he wants to appoint you as the uh, Minister of Finance. On the same day, you meet with Mr. Tony Gupta. We know also... <clears throat> sorry, which same day does he meet with Mr. Gupta? Uh, sorry, on the, on the 8th of December, he goes to, Mr. Gupta, to the Gupta residence. Yeah. And... The last aspect of that... Well, you said you wanted to meet him, but didn't meet him. He says he wanted him. to meet with him. Yeah. But we know that he goes to the Gupta residence. Mm -hmm. The last aspect relates to an issue that emanates from the public protector's report. But I understand from my learned friend that he may have an objection to that. I just want to deal with the witness in relation to the statement that he made to the public protector. Yes, we have got to wrap up. You, Absolutely. You had one point and... Uh, uh, just try and wrap up. Do you wish to make a point? In your, <clears throat> in your letter to the public protector that you wrote on the 24th of March 2017, you apparently said the following to the public protector. During the period between the 4th of December 2015 to the 11th of December of 2015, I was in Durban with my family. I was not a minister at, the, at that stage, so I did not have VIP protection. On the 7th of December, I flew from Durban to Johannesburg at 13.55 for MKMVA meetings where we also met with the Gupta family. That was what you said to the public protector. You said that you had also met with the Gupta family. I don't remember what you're referring to. You don't remember whether your statement included anything like that? You see, the challenge, Chair, is that this is one of the things that was brought last night, and I've never had the chance to go through it. Now I'm expected to, to respond to it. Uh, but uh, the public and with, and, and with respect to it, Chair, it's, yes. it's, it's quite unfair. Uh, Mr. Mr. Harley knows that, that in order for a client to assist him, I, I don't think he understands his role as an, as an evidence leader of the Commission with respect. He's not here to cross-examine my client. He's here to elicit from my client information that would assist you get to the truth. Now, these questions that are meant to trick him into some story are not fair. He should be allowed to engage with the public protector in full so that we know exactly what the full extent of the engagement entailed. It's mm -hmm. not just that, 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 mean, that, uh, that letter that he's reading. Mm -hmm. he, she, he met with the public protector. They engaged with the public protector. Who knows what was said behind, behind that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Harley? Mr. Chair, of course, the witness is at liberty to tell us if there's any further aspect of that that he wishes to say. The point is that I'm raising with him. He can, of course, confirm or deny that he's told the public protector that he met with mm -hmm. the family. It's a simple issue. Uh, did you say, Mr. Van Ruen, you can't remember what you may have written in the letter to the public protector or a statement or letter, I'm not sure what it is. You know, Chair, I just wanted to locate, more especially the issues of the dates and all that, so that's yeah. why it was important for me to be given this information. Yes. Later. But in, with the public protector, of course, I've said yes. it. Yes. I've met the Guptas. Yes. I think the issue, if it's about yeah. uh, the meeting dates. the Guptas as a, as a minister, yeah. then that's something else. Yeah. You know, but yeah. what I'm saying is that Chair, I, I will give a fair and a detailed response. Yeah. If I was given chance to look into that. Yes. And well, I've never denied meeting the Gupta, so it yes. should not be an issue. Well, one one option is that Mr. Hall, if there is anything um, outstanding, 
Thank you. Uh, he could be requested to, you could put questions to him through his lawyers in writing, and he could be requested to respond by way of an affidavit. Okay. Uh, that's, that's, that's another option. Um, Mr. Masu, would you have any problem with that? No, no absolutely not. Yes, yeah. I think that would be fair. Thank you, that, Mr. That, Chair. That, that may fair. be another option in the light of uh, uh, the late hour. Um, okay, all right. Ms. Mr. Van Rooyen, th thank you very much. Sorry, Chair, I yes. just have one question. Okay, a reaction. One. Yeah, yes. okay, all right. Uh, uh, please uh, sanitize before he... Thank you, thank you, Chair. Yes. Just one question mm. um, arising from yes. the question you asked Mr. Van Royen yes. relating to yes. the appointment of persons he did not know. Yes. Mr. Van Royen, is there anywhere in the regulations, in the practice, in the law that requires you to appoint people that you know to the position of a special advisor? Chair, as, as I've uh, elaborated, uh, well, of course, Chair, you have raised your concern, which I, I, I fully accommodate. Uh, usually, what is guiding me uh, is, uh, I mean, the, the mer is, a, is a merit aspect more than any other thing, you know, and uh, maybe that's what is overshadowing my observations on other things. But the reality, the legislation is very clear. South African, fit for purpose, relevant qualifications, no criminal records. I mean, those are clear guidance. The issue of knowing. In fact, uh, if we promote that, I'm worried we might be even be bordering on uh, nepotism or cronism. Yes. Remember, there is a serious accusation now that uh, one has employed a niece in one of the state-owned enterprises. Chair, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Masu. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Van Rooyen, for coming to uh, put your side of the story and to answer questions. Uh, uh, there may be a request for you to deal with further questions by way of affidavit. I'm sure that you will attend to that if uh, such a request arrives. But thank you very much for coming to give evidence today. You, you are excused. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, 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 it has been a long wait, and yes. of course with its own consequences, but yes. it's fine. We understand it's part of the game. Yes. Yes. Uh, but I must also indicate, uh, uh, I really want to wish you well yes. in the, and earth in the truth, because yes. uh, I think this is a very uh, a tedious process. Yes. And that's why I'm insisting that uh, yes. I don't think uh, uh, we will realize any justice if it's only focusing mm -hmm. on these uh, short terms of yes. uh, on these yes. narrow terms yes. of reference. My wish is that yes. you should be uh, given an expanded mandate mm -hmm. to dig deep, more yes. especially on the, the relationship of white capital mm -hmm. with uh, our mm -hmm. democratic state. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are going to adjourn uh, now, and we'll uh, start at 10 o'clock tomorrow.